This is Jocko Podcast number 206 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. And back for a third time is Henry Dick Thompson. I have to throw Henry in there just to make sure when people look for your book, they'll be able to find it. Right. So Dick Thompson, SOG Warrior, was on podcast 203 and 204. If you haven't listened to those, just go and listen to them immediately, and you'll realize the magnitude of the fact that this individual is sitting here alive talking to me is just an absolute miracle. So go listen to 203, 204, where you can hear about Dick's experiences as a SOG team leader and team member in Vietnam. Where we left off was home from Vietnam and now checking in as a ranger instructor, which for you was a great deal because you were gonna have the opportunity to take the lessons you had learned, teach them to the rangers, and also hone them for your own experience because you figured you were eight months away from going back to Vietnam. Yes, so this is my opportunity to get ready and so I could be more focused next time and I could do a better job. Now, when you said eight months, what is it? what was that based on? What was that, when you say I was probably going back over in eight months, what was that based on? Uh, at that time, that was about the turnaround rate. Uh, you come back from Vietnam, they you know, give you a little time to recover and you know, eight months or so, you're gonna get uh, orders to go back again. And you're now, did you make captain yet? Or are you still? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a captain. So yet. now you made captain. <clears throat> The, you must be looking around at the guys that you deployed with and that you knew. I mean, you must be missing a lot of guys now. I mean, wounded, killed, or missing in action. This has got to be just a tremendous number for you. When I, when I look at the ones that, that I knew, that I consider teammates, I mean, we did things together. Uh, we knew each other. Uh, I have a list that I run for, uh, 35 names on it. Those are just the ones that I considered, you know, my personal friends and teammates. Now at CNN, we lost a lot more people than that. I just, I didn't know them very well. Um, But just the time I was there, you know, I got 35 names that I run for. And you got to have that in your back of your mind when you're training these young rangers you know what they're getting into, <clears throat> even if it's not SOG, you know you want to prepare them to the best of your ability for what they're going to face. Yeah, because I knew at that time, I mean, that's, they were going to Vietnam. I mean, there, there was no no doubt, especially if they made it through ranger school. Um, I mean, they were going. So the, the question for me was, in addition to the personal things that I wanted to do, like, you know, improve my skills, what could I do for these guys to – help them have a higher chance of surviving once they get there so I kind of made that my mission so you got you got the normal uh, instruction from a ranger instructor uh, plus because mm-hmm. then I added other things on it and I said D- you got to do this learn how to do this this is how you talk this is how you lead so they got a lot of extra coaching and training whenever I led their group. Um, and I just, I felt responsible you know, to do that. What were some of the leadership <coughs> principles that you focused on teaching the young rangers? Um, some of it was, you know, you gotta be accountable. These are your guys, you gotta be accountable. You gotta take responsibility. Um, if, if you're gonna lead them, you got to make sure you know what you're doing. You got to be physically fit. You got to be mentally fit. You need to know the tactics, techniques. You need to enforce them. You need to encourage them. You need to build a team. You need to take care of them. Uh, you need to know everybody on your team. And if you've got a platoon, you need to know everybody in the platoon. And uh, at at that time, the Army used to issue a little green notebook, pocket size mm-hmm. notebook, hardback that you put in your pocket. And, you know, I would tell them, you need to have your people in here, you know, in, in peacetime. You need to know who they are, know something about them, so you can relate to them when they're having problems and how to train them, you know, the best. 
know what their weak areas are, how you can build them up, because uh, you're accountable for them. They're your people, and you're the guy that's the the leader. You need to be the first one out there. And you know, you know for me, I'm not going to ask you to do something I won't do. I'm not going to go to you and say, uh, hop out the door of the airplane here if I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I tend to, to do more of follow me. You know, I'm going out there. I, I'm going to do it too. And um, I'm going to set the example for you. This is how I want you to do it. And um, so trying to get that through to them and, and trying to get through in terms of think of yourself as a professional. Think about your medical doctor. Every day you should be reading, learning, studying, getting better. Every technique that you know, uh, you should be trying to improve it. Every day is about practice. Um, Whatever it is that you're doing, ask yourself, is there somebody else better than you? Then you need to be practicing. Mm -hmm. You got to get as good as the best because you want to be that person. And you don't get there by just wishing hoping you've got to get out and take the action um, some of the things that you're going to be doing particularly if we if we think ranger uh, <clears throat> special forces seal all that stuff's a mindset it's a mindset you've got to think like that you can be in the greatest physical condition in the world but if you don't have the mindset you can't do it and you guys are already seeing here in ranger school how many of your buddies have already dropped out you know when i went through ranger school <clears throat> we started out with 248 people when we finished we had 175 actually make it to the end of the course 75 of those got a ranger tab mm-hmm. the rest of them didn't so there are only 75 rangers you know uh, produced and it was mindset it, it wasn't that they were bigger, stronger, faster. They had the mental capacity to keep going on one meal a day, three hours of sleep a night, keep pushing, and still be able to think cognitively enough to put together a, a good tactical plan, communicate that plan, execute that plan. Um, and it takes work. And you need to be the leader so people follow you. So, you know, I... Whatever it is that I'm going to do out there that I expect you to do, I want to be doing it to the utmost of my ability. Mm -hmm. If you're going to jump out of an airplane with a rope tied onto you to pull a parachute out, I'm going out from 30,000 feet halo. And that's that's what I do. If you have to have uh, a landing zone the size of a football field to get into, I'll cut it down to a third of that and do it in the dark. I want you to say... It can be done better. Mm-hmm. And if you can beat me, more power to you. You know, because now what you've done is told me I need to practice more. But you're going to make them work <clears> for it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, the, the part that you said about being a professional. And when I talk to young SEALs or young Marines or soldiers or airmen, sailors, whoever, you know, I always say, I always say, you're a professional. And then I tell them, this is your life. This right here <clears throat> is your life. The, the, everything else is secondary to what you're doing right here. And you need to study, you need to learn, you need to read, you need to practice, you need to rehearse, and you need to do that all the time because you're never gonna be good enough. And you need to make this right here your life. Um, you got a couple other notes in here. One of them just says, Staff Sergeant Shelley. <laughs> What's that all about? <clears throat> when I when I went through ranger school in the mountain phase, there was a African American uh, ranger instructor there called Sergeant Shelley. Hardcore, hardcore dude. Rarely did he pass anyone on patrol, and I had him. He graded me one time, and I passed. Uh, when I came back from Vietnam and went to the ranger department, I ended up uh, in the mountains. He ended up on my team. So now I've got the famous Sergeant Shelley on my team. And I thought, man, this is cool. Uh, We we go on a patrol where I'm grading the platoon leader. He's grading grading the platoon sergeant. It's 18 degrees outside. 
Shelly shows up. He's got his fatigue shirt on, but he's got his sleeves rolled up. I said, where's your parker? I don't have a parker. Where are your gloves? I don't need gloves. It's 18 degrees. <laughs> he said, okay, I'm fine. Hard, dude. <laughs> You know, and then we're out on patrol. The snow is almost knee deep. We're dragging the rangers through it. They're tired. They're cold. And, you know, so I call the next patrol leader up, next person who's going to take over the the, the platoon. And I say, all right, ranger, <clears throat> take out your map. And I want you to show me 10-digit coordinates to where we're standing right now because you've got to know where you're starting from. And he kind of looks at me, and I said, take your map out. I don't have a map, sir. Why don't you have a map? He said, well, Sergeant Shelley took my map when we stopped back there and we had to go admin because of the guy getting a frostbite. Um, He took my map. Well, then go ask Sergeant Shelley to give you your map back. Tell him you need it. I can't do that. Why not? So, sir, he built the fire with my map. (laughs) (laughs) I said, okay, then you need to find somebody here that's going to loan you a map. Because you're going to be the patrol leader, you got to have a map. Uh, back then, uh, you could do a lot of things that you know you can't do now. Sergeant Shelley would take onions, cut them in half, rub them all over him. He would eat garlic. He would take him some Kentucky Fried Chicken with him in a bag. And so when it was dark, and the ranger students, you only had to feed them once every three days back then. If they forgot to call in resupplies, they didn't get any food. Or if they called in for resupplies and they didn't ask for food, they just got ammunition. Um, So they were always hungry. And you get under a poncho at night, and Sergeant Shelley would say, all right, ranger, show me me where we are on the map. And the ranger would start to point out where we were, and nobody under the poncho can breathe. Mm-hmm. You know, Shelly smells so bad. You're just taking her breath. Her eyes are watering. And the guy starts to point to where they are in the mouth, and he drops his chicken leg on his finger. <laughs> he said, don't you touch that chicken leg. <laughs> don't you dare lick your finger. Now show me where you are. I mean, he'd do things like that to him all the time. Uh, and he was, he was very good, but he was very hard. Uh, and then as I started to develop a similar reputation, they would hear about it at Fort Benning, and when they got to the mountain phase, and Shelley and I would walk in to take over the patrol for the next 24 hours, and we'd introduce ourselves. You could see the looks on their faces. <laughs> oh, no. One's bad enough. We got both of them at the same time. No one's going to pass. <laughs> but, um, yeah. That, that, I mean, Shelley was a super guy and really smart. And uh, <laughs> got another name down here, Bob Howard. Uh, Bob Howard, Medal of Honor winner. Um, he was sogged down at um, Contum, um, wounded like 13 times, eight Purple Hearts. Um, he was a he, he was a tough guy, and he came up and flew a visual recon with us one one time. And you know, I had already heard some things about him, and I thought, man. I'm kind of nervous about getting in a helicopter with him because, I mean, he just draws bullets. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I'm sure he's going to save most of us, but, you know, I, I might not be one. He's a hard dude. And then he came through ranger school when I was an instructor. So, I I mean, I already— He came through it, ranger school. Yeah. So, so you're an so instructor. So he came back from SOG uh, and uh, it was coming through ranger school, you know, and I ended up grading him. Uh, you know, so I knew. I mean, he, he did a you know a great job, but um, he was he was a hard dude. Um, and then we went to the inf- infantry officer advanced course. He was the the com- company commander of my class. You know, so we were there for a year together like that. Um, you know, he didn't believe in foul language. You got to clean your language up if you were in his organization. Uh, did a lot of things. He, you know, he he was promoted um, to captain, and retired as a full colonel. Ran the airborne school for a while. Uh, did all did all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But you know, 
He, in 11 months, he was put in for the Medal of Honor three times. Got it, got it once, and got, you know, DFCs for the other, uh, a warrior. At one time, he was, I think he was the most decorated person on active duty. And then, you know, after him, after, I mean, he got cancer and passed away, and then I think um, um, Bargewell kind of took over mm -hmm. as the most decorated for a while. Wow. So, hardcore, SOG guy. So at what point did you decide this is going to be your career? Have you already decided that? Or are you still thinking, yeah. well, I'll no. do another tour in Vietnam? Or No, nah, I'm in. You know, You're in. By the time I got through with talk, I mean, <laughs> you know, what would I do if I got out? Yeah. You know, but I, I want to go do some other things. Uh, in, the, in, in the interim, I'll do the, the Ranger stuff to get ready to come back. I'll do another tour here and then figure out, you know, where I go from, you know, SOG. And so sure. now, so now it's 1970, All right? And are you seeing the war wind down yet, or not really? It's still still going pretty strong from where I am and right. what I'm seeing. So I'm still expecting to get orders anytime, and you know uh, that happened. But before that happened, let's see, um, I got a call from Dick Meadows one day, and he said. This is me. <laughs> I can't tell you anything except you're going to get orders and you really want to do this. I need you. Click. So then I got orders to go somewhere on temporary duty. Uh, another guy in the Ranger Department got it. And Meadows was in the Ranger Department at the time and then he'd already been moved out on temporary duty for some reason. And then two more of us get it. Orders like that, the, you know, the ranger department uh, commander said, what's going on? Somebody better tell me what's going on. And you started raising so much, you know, disturbance about not knowing what was going on that they canceled our orders, mine and the other guy, mm -hmm. because of security. They, did, they didn't want people asking questions about something might be going on. So, you know, several months later, it, that was the raid into North Vietnam, into Sante, to um, to the POW camp. Got it. So, you know, I had been picked for that and, um, you know, just didn't get to go. Mm -hmm. um, unbelievable mission. Probably one of the most successful missions we've ever had, except no, no prisoners. Right. Um, they had just been moved. But the training, the knowledge and stuff that came out of that and the way those guys train, you know, having to build the POW camp every night in the darkness so they could practice on it because the daytime the Russian satellites could see it, so you had to time all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then talking about practice, once they figured out how they were going to do the mission, they practiced the mission over 170 times and it, it took a long time mm -hmm. to do a mission so it was most of the night and they were just every day every night they'd go practice that mission and you know training during the day uh, with their skills everybody knew their job I mean one of the guys um, when they landed in the compound one of the guys job was to take out a guard tower and the helicopter was going to land, and he had a certain number of steps to run to to get down behind a, a big tree that was there and use that as cover while he took out the guard tower. Helicopter lands. He runs over, gets down, kneels down, starts firing, taking out the, the guards up there, and then something says, hey, dude, there's no tree here. Where's your tree? And look, it had been cut down. Hmm. But he was right where he was. But if the tree had been there, he was in the right place. He had rehearsed it so many times. And all the stuff was like that. You know, and you got Dick Meadows out there doing his thing. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. Then, um, <clears throat> when, when did you get orders to go back? Uh, about, I'd been there about eight months. And, and I got orders to go back. Um, I had actually signed out and was starting to go on leave. I was going to get, you know, you get 30 day leave before you have to go. Uh, and then I got orders revoking those orders. 
because at that time, to be an instructor in the ranger department, you had to have um, combat experience. Uh. So, and they're running out of people with, you know, particularly officers with combat experience because they're getting out. Yeah. So they put an operational hold <clears throat> on myself and I think about three or four other guys that said, nope, you're not going anywhere. You're going to stay right where you are, keep doing what you're doing. Um, you know, so I was already set to go back, to go to SOG, had everything set up, and then they said, no, you're going to remain in place. So, so how long did you end up staying as a ranger instructor? A little over three years. Yeah, a long time. And now you definitely are seeing the war wind down. I'm seeing the war wind down. I'm seeing the protest. I'm, just, I'm seeing a lot of different things now. But still uh, very you know, proud to be in the military, proud to, to be a ranger, or special forces, and whatever. So I'm not thinking about getting out now. And, and you got married sometime around this time frame? That deal was confirmed right after I got orders revoking the trip back to Vietnam. Um, so, yeah. So I got the married. deal got confirmed. I like that. Yeah. You know, because what I had said was uh, it would probably be better. Let me do the tour. And when, when I come back, you know, then we can get married mm-hmm. rather than, you know, something happening to me. Uh, and you becoming a widow and all that kind of stuff. Let's let's not do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, once my orders were revoked, then okay, now we can move forward. We we'll go ahead and do it. <laughs> and then your next tour was uh, went to Korea. Uh, yes. Well, I, I went to the advanced course down at Benning for a year, and then went from there to Korea. What were you do? What the uh, uh, the officer advanced, advanced course. course? Yeah. And that's to prepare you to be a company commander. Uh, company commander or, yeah, really to start moving you up toward the next level. If, you, if you're if you going to get promoted, you know, you got to go to the right. advanced course. You know, and that's when uh, Bob Howard was down there. There were some other people from SOG that I knew there. Um, and Was it interesting to see the, the guys, like the guys from SOG, the guys from Special Forces in there, <laughs> now they're teaching the, the company commanders for infantry? What kind of... What kind of lessons were going back and forth from those two elements? Uh, you know, as you know, being there, I learned a lot about you know just the mechanized units and things like that. You know, because I I'd never been in one. I've been in you know some kind of special ops group. I didn't I didn't understand about people outside of special ops. I didn't understand about someone that you could say, okay, we got to get this accomplished this afternoon, Sergeant Jones. And this afternoon I go, look, and it's not done. What? How could that happen? I mean, you tell a special ops guy, I mean, this needs to be done. It's done. I mean, it, I just, it was a different mindset, different. It, I'm not trying to demean anybody that wasn't in special ops, but it's just a different mindset. Mm-hmm. So getting used to that. Uh, when I got to Korea, I had, well, ahead of time, I had um, written a letter to the commanding general when I found out I was going to 2nd Infantry Division, and uh, and he was prior SF. So I had written a, a letter to him and said, you know, I'm coming. I want to command a company, but I want to command a ranger company. I think the 2nd Infantry Division could benefit from a provisional ranger company. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do is take over a company and let me convert it. And, you know, if anything happens with North Korea, I'm out there. You know, you put us <laughs> in there first, and, I mean, we'll go do it. <clears throat> and uh, it created a lot of controversy with the staff and other people that found out that I had written the commanding general a letter. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> in fact, in the battalion that I was assigned to, there was a couple of weeks there before I got to take over the company. Uh, the battalion commander brought me in, you know, right off the bat, and he said, let me tell you something, Thompson. You've never been in a, a real Army unit. Mm-hmm. You won't last a month. You will be relieved of your command within a month. You're mm-hmm. a snake eater. You don't know how we do things, and you're not going to survive here. And I'm sorry that I'm not going to be here to see it, but you know, I'm leaving Korea in about a week or so. Um, 
but my replacement will see you. And I thought, man, that's a motivational way to greet a new guy coming in. So anyway, um, a company called Bunky Bravo it became my company. And within a few days, we painted the wall of the building, you know, black and gold. It became Bravo Rangers. Um, <laughs> and we we had a game there that was called combat football. You had 40 people on the field <laughs> from each team with two balls in play at a time. Um, and you had to have So it's ten. 40 people per side. Yeah. So like and, and platoon you, and, strength. And you had, you had 10 substitutes that you could use. So I, before I took over, I, I went down, and I got a new first sergeant. He and I came in at the same time. So I said, well, let's go down and watch him play this combat football game, see what's going on. So we go down. Bravo Company couldn't get enough people on the field to play the game. They had to forfeit the game because nobody would go out there except you know half a dozen people. And I'm thinking, what? Why, why are they not going out there? And I told, I told the first sergeant, I said, Top, when we take over, things are going to change around here. <laughs> this company is going to see the world differently. Um, so once we took over, we had a combat football game a couple of days later. So I took the company down <clears throat> to the field, and they're all standing there. And I walked out onto the field, and I faced them, and I said, okay, I'm number one. Top, where are you? First sergeant went running out. I said, okay, top, you're number two. Where are my lieutenants? Lieutenants, get out here. Okay, now we got some more players. Where are the NCO? Why are there no NCOs out here? All the NCOs, get on the field. Okay, top, figure out how many spaces we have left in case some of the troops want to play. Whew, they were all out on the field wanting to play. I said, man, if all the officers and the NCOs are going to play, you know, it, it's like we were talking about before. I'm not going to put you out on a game like that where you could break your leg or something if I'm afraid to go out there. You know, that's leadership. You get out there. Follow me. I'll show you how to do it. I might not be the best player on the field, uh, but I'm going to give it my best. Won the division championship twice while I was there. <laughs> yeah. How um, did uh, – how did – two two parts – when you took over Bunky Bravo, which I'm, I'm, I'm imagining is a pretty slack attitude for them. And, you know, sometimes people get the impression, oh, well, when you come in like that, you got to drop the hammer on everyone. How did you balance dropping the hammer to everyone, creating a distance between you and them, and actually, you know, and you just described one way that you did it, which is, hey, <coughs> I'm going to be the first one out here. I'm going I'm to lead from the front. Was there any other techniques as a leader that you utilized to turn that to turn the, 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 the folks that forfeited matches to the folks that win the championships t two times? There were several things that happened. <clears throat> yeah, as you can imagine, with Bunky Bravo, uh, there was a lot of drug users, particularly um, marijuana. So I was walking through the company area <clears throat> excuse me, about a week before I took over, and I was walking by... Uh, the barracks and I was the window was open and I was listening and they were talking about this new guy coming in as company commander and they were talking about you know we have to get rid of him and they were talking to a Korean guy and they were talking about what's it going to cost us to have something happen to him mm. so I hear that for a little bit and then all of a sudden I just kicked the door open and I step in and I said <laughs> you know we haven't met yet I'm Captain Thompson, and I, I'm curious. Do you have enough money to pay this guy to take me out? Because if you don't, let me loan you some money so he can try to do that. <laughs> but you won't notice. You know, drugs are going to be out of here. Everything's going to change around here like that. So you get with the program, you're in good shape. Mm -hmm. You want to use drugs, you're, you're going to have a real problem. Mm -hmm. And I'll fast forward just a little bit, but what I found was – you could catch someone with marijuana, <clears throat> and as a company commander, I could fine them. I could take their money. I could reduce their rank. But I know that had no meaning to them. So then I thought, what do they value the most? Their free, free time. <laughs> so, you know, a guy gets caught with marijuana, and he comes in, and, and uh, he says, uh, how much is it going to cost me, sir? 
I said, I don't want your money. And he said, why? I said, I don't want your money. But at 1700, you report here to the first sergeant. I said, look out my window. You see that big creek right next to the area here? Yes, sir. I said, you see all those rocks on the creek bank on the other side? He said, yes, sir. I said, tomorrow they're going to be back on this side. <laughs> but you can't do that. I said, yes, you can. Mm-hmm. I can give you extra duty, and that's what's going to happen every night for a while. I can give you seven days of extra duty, and you won't be going to the village. And the word spread like wildfire. He's, an, he's a crazy man. You know, he doesn't want your money. He's going to keep you here, moving rocks back and forth. So we started to get the drugs out, things like that. Uh, you know, we, we had the combat football. I was able to get extra helicopters so we could, you know, they got to play with helicopters. They got to learn how to build rope bridges. We put on a demonstration for the president when he came over, different things like that. And then one of the techniques, um, I know this. <coughs> Excuse me, this won't show up, but I just want to give you an example of the power of motivation. Unless I get in trouble here. <sighs> Company formation, and I said, all right, you guys need to understand. You belong to Bravo Rangers. You're better than anybody else here. You can outperform them. You can outrun them. You can outdo whatever. This is a special company that you belong to, and the rest of them don't. So when I finish talking, I want you to report to the first sergeant, and he's going to issue you a Bravo Ranger card. And this card says that you are a member of Bravo Rangers. And you need to understand, if anyone in this company, including myself, catches you down in the village and says, show me your card, and you can't produce it, you're going to buy everybody at that (laughs) table a round of whatever they're drinking. And also understand, if you lose this thing, you have to come to me to get a new one and explain to me how you you lost it. I won't won't say necessarily on uh, the podcast here what it says on the back of this card, but (laughs) I'll uh, let, let you... Look at the the back of it. <clears throat> they got so excited about those cars. That was the most valuable thing that they owned in in the company. Well, the I'll, I'll I'll read one part of it. You've never lived until you've almost died, and until you fight for it, life has a special flavor that only a ranger will ever know. Bravo, Rangers! And then there's some various <laughs> there's some various uh, <clears throat> special activities that the Bravo Rangers are are capable of executing <laughs> and they're not all legal i'll say <laughs> so that's that's outstanding outstanding but, now, but the but the power it hasn't happened to me for some time now but in the 90s i mean it was in korea in the 70s in the 90s i'd be walking through the air, atlanta airport and a guy would say, hey, sir, you know, and I'm, you know, Sergeant Jones or whomever. Uh, and he'd introduce himself, and the next thing out of his mouth was, you got your card? <laughs> <laughs> and he would have his card. I mean, it, it was amazing how many people I would run into over the years, and one of the first things they would say, you got your card? I got mine. <laughs> they were still carrying these cards. That's why it's in here. Yeah. If I see Just one, in case. first yeah. thing they're going to do is ask me about it. So, that uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm I'm a a big uh, I don't know what the right word is, but I I learned a lot from David Hackworth from Colonel David yeah. Hackworth, and one of the things that he <clears throat> did was rename the hopeless battalion in in Vietnam that he took over into the hardcore, and like yeah. when I took over <clears throat> for Task Unit Bravo at SEAL Team Three as the Task Unit Commander, I immediately changed the name to Task Unit Bruiser instead. Mm-hmm. Same exact idea, and I've mm-hmm. I got a great email recently from a guy that had changed the name of his his uh, his uh, at a big construction company and had his team change the name of his team and it like changed the attitude yeah. and all yeah. of a sudden they started completing projects and just that that little element and there's a part an important part to it is you can't just change the name 
and expect like, oh, now everything's different. That's an element of it. Right. You have to do the other things. You have to say, oh, we're going to work hard. We're going to fight hard. We're going to we're going to win this championship. We're going to we're going to be the best here. You can't just change the name and expect that to happen. You're going to have to do work behind it. You know, pride comes from pride comes from struggle and and overcoming struggle. That's what pride comes from. So when people ask me how do you develop pride in a team? Cool. You want to develop pride in a team? You make them do hard stuff. Mm-hmm. Hard training, go through you, you know even with military units that have battle streamers. That's that's the pride that they've carried right. for 50 <clears throat> years, 100 years since they did whatever, you know, thing in World War 1 or World War 2 or Korea or Vietnam. That's something that that unit achieved and that gives them pride. So you can't just change the name and expect, oh cool, I changed the name, now I'm good to go. No, you need to change the name and then you need to give them something to be proud of, which means some kind of struggle to get through, some kind of pain to get through that not only does it give them the sense of achievement, it also brings them together. Right. Because when you, when you, that shared suffering that you go through, whether it's boot camp or airborne school or special forces selection or a hard training mission, all those things, what they do is bring you together. And the ultimate form of that is, is combat, you know, which is why you can, you can go through a, be a member of, of a guy that was in SOG and you reach out to Tilt, you guys never met before, and all of a sudden, hey, yep, we'll, we'll meet up at some point and you can move forward. You guys have that camaraderie because of what that unit achieved and the struggles that you went through. So, uh, the other question I wanna ask is, with when it relates to going, how do you keep that in check, at least, well, from your perspective, for you, because now all of a sudden <laughs> you got guys that are walking around with their chest bowed out, and you start get professional jealousy from the other company commanders and they're gonna try and make you look bad and they're talking behind you. How, how did you contend with that kind of thing? And keeping your guys from becoming arrogant, which is a, a possibility. It's a real issue, a big issue. <laughs> and it also happens internally. So uh, we're, we're out on, on a range practicing and, and we're out there for uh, a week. And all of a sudden the first sergeant says, Sir, you need to come with me. We got a little issue going on out here. And there was a, a little bank that had a road on it, and there was a little road, you know, 30, 40 feet below. Um, third platoon was coming down the road. First platoon was going the other way. Third platoon made some little comment to first platoon, and a hail of rocks came down. You know, it's, and, and, you know, we had to go break up a rock fight yeah. because they were so pumped. And, you know, no, you're not better than us. You can't call us names. Yeah. Oh, geez. You know, all right, guys. These are your own people. Yeah. These are your own the people. The enemies outside and, the wire. And, yeah. <laughs> and you, you can be fired up. But, yeah, and other company commanders, uh, even another uh, the battalion commanders were upset uh, because the general – I mean, I'd been there maybe, well, a week, and all of a sudden, I mean, in in command, and all of a sudden, the siren goes off, and the siren is deployed to your battle positions, and you don't know if it's real or not, it's just deployed, so um, I run back down to my, uh, you know, my headquarters, and the first sergeant's there, and and say, okay, what's up? And he said, you know, you got to deploy to the the battle positions. Um, I think you need to go to the battalion commander's office and find out which battle plan we're implementing. Don't worry about the company. I know we have to be out the front gate in two hours. We'll be there. You go find out where we're going and what we're going to have to do. Uh, I'll make sure we get everybody here and we load up everything and take it with us. Um, so I go get it, and I, I come back, and we, we're in the head of the whole battalion. So we're going to lead the whole brigade uh, out of Camp Hobie to wherever the battle position is. And <clears throat> just as we start to move, a jeep runs over. My, my uh, radio operator's foot breaks his foot, so I got to <laughs> throw him in the, in the ambulance. But we go, and, and uh, we get, you know, Late at night, we get up on the mountain in the in the area that we're supposed to defend, and we have to dig in, dig fighting positions and everything. It's just getting daylight. I got everybody dug in, and they're putting in firing stakes, aiming stakes, and all that. And I hear this wop wop wop, and a helicopter pops up, <clears throat> sets down on a ridge. This guy gets out, and all I can see are those stars on us. 
Uh, and, and he come, comes over and, you know, I'm saluting and he says, you know, Captain Thompson, I, I want to uh, see uh, your fighting positions. So he walks around the ridge and we talk about him and he's asking me, quite, why did you put this one here? Why is it oriented like this? He asked the, the soldiers in the fighting position some questions here and there. And, you know, that takes about 30 minutes. And he comes back, he gets in his helicopter and he leaves. And I said, wow. I wasn't expecting the division commander to show up all of a sudden. It, it wasn't 20 minutes. Wop, 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 wop. Here's the helicopter back up there again. He gets off. His boss, a three-star, steps out with him, and he comes to me and he says, I want you to take us around. I want you to show him your battle positions. So they get in the helicopter and leave, and I was a hero. I mean, he's ranting and raving to the whole division about how great – you know, Bravo Company looks and all this stuff and a patent of a battalion commander on the back and throwing my name out. And then he starts showing up uh, at least once a week at my mess hall. The division commander walks into my little company mess hall to eat breakfast on a regular basis. And, you know, and he talks, we talk about the things I've got the company doing and what I need them to do. Uh, and you start to share that. I said, you know, you get the company again. You th- why do you think the division commander comes down here? Does he go to other people's and assault? No, he's coming to Bravo Company. <laughs> Look around you. What do you guys do? I mean, you're f- ferocious at combat football. Combat football is his thing. He invented it, mm-hmm. and you guys are animals out there. <laughs> and he loves it. And and I it, we we won. You know, best tactical platoon in the contest it was had. I I called Private Jones up and I said, "Look." Jones won third place in the the division Christmas card drawing contest. Third place, guys. Out of the 10,000 people in the division, he got third place. I mean, it doesn't matter what we do. You guys are winners. We can do it. We, you know, we just keep this up. And, you know, so there's just constantly having things to, to do. And like I said, we won the football championship twice. <laughs> We won the Taekwondo, Taekwondo Championship. Uh, you know, I was a player coach on, on our team. And we won the champion, Taekwondo Championship uh, in the division and uh, just all kinds of things because they were so pumped up, and they do whatever you'd point them at. And they, it was like they couldn't lose except, you know, you had to put up with the people who were jealous mm-hmm. um, because he was down there with us all the time. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then you know we they sent us to they sent us to to be the immediate reaction force for the nuclear sites. You had to ro- they had to rotate people through there. Uh, so you're on a 30 minutes notice to deploy <clears throat> to wherever whatever nuclear site might be under attack. So I walked in and I'm, we're we're looking around and I'm looking at the battle plans and I'm saying you know this this is pretty cool. You know I mean maybe they'll activate us and we we'll have to go do something. I said, you know, I would feel better if I could see the live ammunition that we have for the mission. Well, you can't see it. It's, you know, it's got, it's in, they're in foot lockers. The magazines are locked up. They have steel bands around them. Um, you, you can't really see it. I said, get a pair of bolt cutters. I want to see it. Open those boxes up. Nobody had opened one of those boxes in 10 years. The magazines were rusty. Mm-hmm. The, the ammunition wouldn't feed out of it. Uh, created a major stir when I reported that we needed new ammunition mm-hmm. because it was, wasn't functional. Uh, a few days later, I said, you know, we've got a battle plan here that says we're supposed to fly into this LZ up here and support uh, a- around this nuclear site. I said, get a helicopter. Get some choppers. Let's load up the first platoon. I want to make that insertion. You couldn't land. Mm. Trees had grown up since that plan was written. There was no LZ there. Mm. You know, so I reported that. And battalion commander said, Thompson, back off. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to find anything. Just back up. You got me in so much trouble. I said, it's not trouble. I mean, what if we had to do something? Yeah. So, anyway, that was a lot of Well, all, those are awesome <clears throat> leadership lessons. And then uh, after that, you go back to Bragg and – 
Emergency <coughs> Deployment <coughs> Readiness Exercise Evaluation for Special Forces and Rangers. So you're like an, ev an evaluator at so, this point? Yeah, so uh, all of the Special Forces and Rangers, you know, came under the 18th Airborne Corps. <coughs> the division commander from Korea is now the 18th Airborne Corps commander. Okay. So, Did he call you out by name and bring you back there? Yeah. <laughs> so he, he had me brought there to do special projects and things. So, um, And one of them was, you got to be on this team. I want somebody that knows about special ops that, that can deploy. You know, So I would show up at a Ranger Battalion headquarters at 2 o'clock in the morning, hand the CQ a, a paper classified document that says, uh, wheels up in two hours. And, you know, kind of get out of the way because <laughs> that place was going to come alive. And <clears throat> then I would go with them. I'd, you know, be one of the evaluators. If they put in a Halo team, I would jump with the Halo team and evaluate them. Uh, we'd take them on classified missions sometimes. Uh, there's a lot of things that, you know, we would do with them that I just ate up because, mm -hmm. you know, it was all special ops stuff. <laughs> um, so I got to do that. That was a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, the sniper team came under us. Sniper, all the sniper training at Fort Bragg, that was under us. So I could go out and play with the snipers and, you know, shoot and uh, improve my skills. And, and so what are you at this point? At this point, are you a major? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, are you still a captain? No, I'm still a captain. And then the, what about the next time that Dick Meadows called you up? Circa 1978. <coughs> He actually showed up at my house. Okay. One better. I, 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 I have several people like that that if they called or they showed up at my house, my wife was not happy <laughs> because she knew they were there for one reason. There was something they wanted me to do that she was not going to want me to do. Um, so Meta shows up. I didn't know it was coming, you know. Pulls up in my driveway. I was outside and I saw him. And so we go talk, and he said, <clears throat> I need you. I said, We're putting together a special group. I need you to come in and be part of my cadre to help set this thing up and also evaluate and train the people and be an operator in this group when we get it set up. And he said, I, I really can't tell you any more than that. Was you the guy I want? And I said, does it mean right now? And he said, yeah. And I said, my wife is pregnant with our third child. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I just sold my house here. I just bought a house in Athens, Georgia. I just got accepted into the doctoral program in University of Georgia and named off a bunch of things like that. And I said, I, I can't just stop this process right here. And he, he was not happy. And, you know, his final comment to me was, uh, you've hung up your guns. And I said, I haven't hung up my guns. I just, I need to delay it for about, you know, two years. And I can come back and do anything you want. And he said, no, I need you right now. And that was the last time we had a face-to-face -face encounter. <laughs> that was and, it. And the group he was setting up was Delta. <clears throat> the, yeah, you said that was the last time he ever asked you to go anywhere with him. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, now, what, what, what <clears throat> had made you want to go to college? And what were you going to study? <clears throat> you asked me... Um, early on about going to OCS and only having a year and a half of, of college. When I left the 2nd Infantry Division as a captain and you know, came back to the States, I was assured secondary zone promotion. You know, I was going to make major way before any of the other captains in my year group and stuff. Um, it was a done deal. Promotion list came out, and I wasn't on it. Mm -hmm. which is not bad because many people only a few people you know, get a secondary um, but I wasn't on it so when I called Mill Percent and at DC and said what happened and he said well 
you know, you were not considered. Oh, why not? He said, you know, first thing we did was we went through all the records and divided you into two piles. College degree, not a college degree. Mm-hmm. You don't have a college degree. That was that. You were not eligible. You wasn't even looked at beyond that. So that irritated me. You know, I said, look at my performance. Nobody's outperforming me and all this stuff. Um, so then eventually I, I talked to him and I you said. You wasted all your luck staying alive in combat. <laughs> yeah, I guess I did. And then I said, you know, okay, then I'll go to school at night and I'll finish the degree. So I did, and then once I finished his degree, then I uh, I got a call from them saying, how would you like to go get a master's degree? I said, you wouldn't let me get an undergraduate, but now you want to send me for a master's. I said, okay, I'm interested in that. My plan was, why do I want a master's? Let me find a school that has an ROTC program that I'm, I could get a follow-on assignment to you after I finish the master's program. So what I do is I enroll in a PhD program, complete the master's along the way. You know, I'll have a two year or more assignment with RLTC. I'll be able to finish out the doctorate. So the next time you want to ask about education, <laughs> you know, I'll have it. You can call me doctor major. That's, that's right. <laughs> uh, you know, so here, here I come. Uh, like I said before, you know, if you're going to do it, you do it. You practice, you do what you have to do, you take the lead. So, and what did you get your doctorate psych- in? Uh, psychology. So, uh, you know, I think we talked before about um, I started out in chemistry. And I found myself on the battlefield leading men in combat. And I was kind of looking around and thinking, I need to learn how to motivate people. I need to understand the psychology of motivation, the psychology of people. Human, if I'm, if human I'm going, nature. Yeah, if I'm going to be a leader, I need to learn about that, not chemistry. Um, so when I went back to school, I went back to school with psychology so I could learn how to do that stuff with them. Um, and in reality, I think I've, I've gone full circle. And now I understand it's the chemicals and things in your brain that's <laughs> driving all this other stuff. Uh, if you deal with those, you, there's a lot you can do. But, um, yeah, I, I got to do a lot of things. Uh, I helped put together the uh, Airland Battle 2000, how we were going to do war fighting in the 21st century. I got to do all kinds of uh, research on sleep, on stress. Uh, how are we going to fight? Because we were predicting in the 80s, we were predicting the next ground war was going to be 100 hours straight you know, before there was any break. So how are you going to keep people awake that long and keep them effective, perform the mission? How are you going to create high-performing leaders, high-performing battle staffs, high-performing teams? What does that mean? Uh, so I got to go all over the place and, you know, meet really smart people and learn from them and, and work on projects like that, do research like that, uh, a lot of which was, you know, used in... Uh, some in the Falklands because I worked with the British Army staff uh, on, and you know the head general at the time there said we're not doing that. They're just gonna stay awake. I said they can't stay awake, not that long. Mm-hmm. So there's some things you have to do. That, but uh, he discovered that in the Falklands, uh, you have to do some things to keep them going. And then you know the Gulf War, the ground phase was a hundred hours. Mm-hmm. Um, my brother, you know, Butch, a uh, helicopter pilot or a Apache pilot, he didn't get out of the aircraft. He would come in to refuel. They would feed him, you know, while the aircraft's rearming, refueling, and send him right back out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, using, you know, some different things to, <clears throat> excuse me, keep them away. So, anyway. So then you, was the, was the uh, Command and General Staff College, was that your final tour? No, um, that was one where, you know, my luck had run out. So when I finished, I was going back to, to a regular unit. And then they realized that I was the only infantry officer in the class that had a PhD. <laughs> and the, the general out there, the commandant said, you're not going anywhere. 
If you're staying here to work with me on this air land battle stuff, I, I need somebody that thinks like you do and has the combat experience and everything to work on this with me. You know, so they kept me there for four years, counting the, the year I was in school. Uh, and then they uh, called me up and said, how would you like to be the professor of military science at the University of Georgia? So you go back, and I said, when are you calling me? Why, where's this coming from? <laughs> and I said, well, actually, the university is turning down everybody we send, every applicant to be the professor of military science. They're finding a reason not to, uh, not to accept him. But they can't do that to you. You've had an ROTC assignment there. You've been the XO of, of mm -hmm. the department. Uh, you got a PhD, a master's and PhD from there. You know, <laughs> academically, you've got everything that's saying, so your name's off all your stuff. And he says, I have to take you. And I think, well, okay, I'll try that. So they took me, and I, you know, just finished up there because I had started um, high performing systems kind of on the side. Mm -hmm. It's just something to play with. Uh, but it started growing so fast. And. You know, you can't <clears throat> have an engagement with a client, and then the general decides, I need you at Fort Bragg for a meeting mm -hmm. on Monday morning, and you, you can't do that. I mean, you can't turn the clients down if you want to keep them. So now I'm having a conflict, so I decided, you know, 21 years, that's enough. I'll get out and go do the company because I've set the company up to be able to do the kinds of things I like to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't get to shoot at people. Um, but they don't get to shoot at me either. Which is also uh, nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it, at that time, outdoor training was a big deal. Ropes, mm. courses, all yeah. that kind of repel to throw in the briar patch. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can do that stuff in my sleep and I enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, so we had executives jumping off cliffs and going down rivers and rafts and all this stuff. And that played out. You know, toward the end of the 90s, people started saying, been there, done that, I want mm -hmm. something different. So, you know, we changed up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so somewhere along the way, you wrote, uh, you wrote this <coughs> book, The Stress Effect. <laughs> right. Which, um, which I, I read and definitely has some, some, uh, some really good information in it. And I wanted to hit some of the information that you put in there. Um, just to kind of give people a feel for the book. I'm not going to do as much of a detailed <coughs> as, well, as I would do with, with like the document that we read about rest and recuperation on the last <laughs> podcast. But, you know, just to give people some feel for what your what this book contains. So I'm coming out of here out of the gate. Researchers Shelley Kirkpatrick and Edwin Locke state, it is unequivocally clear that leaders are not like other people. Leaders do not have to be great men or women by being intellectual geniuses or omniscient prophets to succeed. But they do need to have the right stuff, and this stuff is not equally present in all people. So this is interesting, because you're saying something that a lot of people don't wanna hear, right? which is, hey, there are certain leadership traits that you may or may not be born with, and that's the reality of the situation. Now, I talk about this a lot too, and I actually say the same thing, and I have this description that I use in saying that you know, you're gonna get different capabilities that you have as a human being, and what you can do as a leader is if you have an area of weakness, if you're smart, you'll bring people onto your leadership right. team that complement your areas of weakness. But you can only do that if you have the humility to admit that hey, I'm not that great at planning, or hey, I'm not that great at paperwork, or hey, I'm not that good at talking to the troops. Whatever areas of weakness you have, if you can admit to them and bring people onto your team that can complement that and say, hey, you know what, I'm not great talking to the troops. Dick, you know, can you get out there and, and deliver the word? And you go, yeah, I got it. And that's fine, as long as I can admit it. But if I won't admit it, and my ego's in the way, and even though I'm not good at communicating with the troops, I decide I'm the one that has to get up there and do it, and I bumble around and, and leave them walking away, not feeling confident about it, that's bad. Mm -hmm. So this this idea right here that we all get, you know, you, you're going to get some qualities, but you're going to be missing some too. And right. so that's something we all have to admit. Um, 
you go here, you talk about learned ability, which includes job knowledge, skills, and experience is a critical component of leadership and decision making. Selecting a former GE executive just because she was an employee of GE to run a hospital corporation or a publishing company does not make sense. Just because someone worked for an organization without, with an outstanding reputation doesn't necessarily mean that individual become, will become an outstanding leader who makes outstanding decisions, especially if she does not have the learned ability for that role, level, and industry. This is not to say that high-performing leaders can't successfully switch organizations and assume higher roles. However, it's not a given. Right. Important point there. I have a company where we place veterans into organizations. And a lot of times people think, oh, well, the person has veteran experience, so they're going to be 100% good to go. And as much as I would love to say that, you can't say that. That's why we do a screening process and we actually train them to for that transition. But this is the same thing. People, just because people are from an organization like, you know, GE has that reputation for their leadership. Yeah. <clears throat> But that doesn't mean that that person is necessarily a good leader. And you have to be careful of that. Um, and, and, and this section here, I have to say, was I found very interesting. Individual leader complexity, find the person who can do the work. And so you get into this topic here. Simply put, leader complexity refers to a leader's ability to handle the the requirements of his or her job. Depending on the size and type of an organization, a leader's job is often enormously complex. Two factors determine ability to work at a particular level of of complexity, learned and innate abilities. So once again, you're talking about innate abilities, meaning that people have limitations. Right. And, you know, my big point to that or my, my, my thoughts around that is the people that really have problems aren't the people that don't realize that they have limited, that they have limited innate capabilities, which means everyone. We all have things that we're not good at. <clears throat> the people that can't admit that are going to have real problems. Now you get into this. All leaders have limitations to what they can learn and how far up the leadership ladder they can climb. Innate ability as it pertains to leadership consists of four major factors, cognitive ability, emotional intelligence, motivation, and personality. And this is the most, this is, this is the section that I really was very interested in because I work with a lot of different leaders all the time because I have a consulting company too and we work with leaders all the time. So this topic here of cognitive ability. Cognitive ability is how a leader processes, organizes, stores and retrieves information, thus determining how she creates the world she lives in, makes sense of it, and acts on it. Cognitive ability is a key determinant of a leader's ability to be successful at different organizational role levels. Unlike learned skills, cognitive ability is not trainable. It is a hardwired ability that unfolds through a natural maturation process across one's lifespan. A leader's cognitive ability determines how she approaches problem solving, decision making, and interpersonal interactions. Let's look at the general characteristics of cognitive ability going from high to low. So now we start talking about the actual person that has high cognitive ability. And this is interesting, and we may have to come back to this one, that it's not trainable. That's an interesting statement because I would think, and I've seen people get better at you know simp- coming up with simple solutions and dealing with stress. So maybe that doesn't fall; those things don't fall quite in the category of cognitive ability. But here's what you say about the higher the higher a leader's cognitive ability is, the lower the need for consistency in the information being processed. This is a very important thing. Right? I'm gonna read it again. The higher a leader's cognitive ability level is, the lower the need for consistency in the information being processed. What that means to me is, and this is very, very prudent on the battlefield, is like you're not gonna get consistent information out there. And if that bothers you, if you can't wrap your mind around different pieces of information coming in that are contradictory to one another, you're gonna have a problem making a decision. 
That's what you're saying right there. Yes. You you need to be able to haul, uh, have contradicting thoughts, ideas, concepts, information in your mind, both of them at the same time, and still function. Mm-hmm. You know? And they can, you know, they're opposites of each other, but you can still deal with that. Yeah. It's not going to stop you from moving forward. And you'll find a way to use that information to, to fit in with what you're trying to do. Yeah, the, the hopes that I have in going through this with a little bit of detail is that people recognize this. People recognize what we're talking about. I wrote one of the books I wrote is called The Dichotomy of Leadership. And it's, it's about this idea that you as a leader are going to have different forces pulling you in opposite directions. And you need to learn how to balance those different opposing forces. With just about every trait that we have, that's what you need to be able to do. So I hope when people hear this, that they say to themselves, oh, I get wrapped around the axle if, if two different pieces of information are opposing each other. This is really important. I hope that even though it's not trainable, I hope that you can actually, when people get recognition of it, they can go, oh, you know what? I know what's happening right now. I'm hearing two different pieces of information and my tendency is just to want to focus on one or ignore them both, but I, I don't make a decision. Where I, What I need to do is think about how both these things are actually true or possibly true. All right, you go on, and this is a great example. Consider the question, do cell phones cause brain cancer? You can find as many studies that say it does as it does not. At lower cognitive ability levels, most people would find the inconsistency in the research confusing. Their response would be, there must be a right answer. The low cognitive ability leader may choose to ignore the data altogether or pick the data that support her position. So there you go. Classic example. Hey, look, there's got to be a right answer. We need to know what the real deal is. When, as you know, you can Google, and right now you can Google anything, and you can get supporting data for any hypotheses that you have. Right. And if you have low cognitive ability, Whichever one you think is right, that's where you'll pull all that data to back yourself up. It says this, in contrast, the high cognitive ability leader understands that there is no single answer and tends to look at the implications of cell phone use in the organization or how to put in safeguards just in case the phones do cause cancer. She does not let the inconsistency prevent her from making a larger decision in which cell phones play a role. So you can still function, as you said. Almost any topic contains some level of data inconsistency. What financial markets are going to do in the future? When the construction industry will rebound? Which airlines will survive? And whether we need more FA-22 Raptors, which is currently the world's most advanced fighter. The key is that high cognitive ability leaders rise above the level of inconsistency and make decisions. They're not waiting for everything to be perfect. And I I would just add to that. There's a a level of cognitive ability that you get to where you realize there is no single right answer for anything. Therefore, any answer that you choose, any solution that you choose will have a downside. At some point in the future, there will be unintended consequences for whatever you choose now. So in a, in a lot of cases, with the people who can think forward, they're looking at which unintended consequences am I willing to accept You know, at some point. Uh, if I have enough time between now and then to begin to put in something that may you know, counter that. I know they're coming. It's going to happen. Uh, but I'm going to make a decision and we're going to move forward. It's mm-hmm. worse not to make a decision mm-hmm. uh, because that's an unintended consequence too. Yeah. So There'll be, there'll be an yeah. unintended consequences for no action. You go on here. Leaders with lower levels of cognitive ability are constrained by the information they receive. Infor- information must be consistent for them to make sense of it. 
High cognitive ability leaders, by contrast, rely on themselves to provide missing information, look for more novel information, and search across more domains to find information. Which is interesting. Search across more domains. That means there's a problem over here that's in a certain arena, and a, a high cognitive thinker will look at that arena and go, you know what, that reminds me of this other arena. Right. And I can apply this and overlay it to this r- arena that I'm looking at right now and, and further my decision-making process. Add color to it. <clears throat> the greater they show, and this is again the high cognitive ability leaders, they show greater certainty in judging inconsistent information and are more focused on long-term strategies than low cognitive ability leaders are. The low cognitive ability leaders are looking at the short-term game. The leader with high cognitive abilities uses multiple dimensions when processing information. These multi-dimensional, this multi-dimensional approach creates a high probability that the leader will match some facet of herself with a facet of another person during interpersonal interactions. This leader is more inclined toward assimilation of information about herself than a leader with lower cognitive ability is. Thus, leaders with high cognitive ability show a propensity for receiving feedback. They seek out information about themselves, are open to feedback, and assimilate this information into knowledge about themselves. This goes back to me talking about being a humble person. If you're a humble person, you can take feedback and you can uh, put it into your world. And the other, the, the part that I found interesting about this um, is that the high probability, um, the high cognitive leader will match some facet of herself with the facet of the other person. So when they're, when, when I'm having a discussion with you and you're, you're, you have a different perspective that, or you're opposing me, you're arguing with me, instead of me saying, no, you're wrong, I, I will look at you and say, oh, what's, wh- where are they getting that perspective? Oh, I see where he's getting that perspective from. That actually makes sense because he's on the front lines and he's doing this. Oh, okay. So I actually will put some facet, I will match some facet of myself to you so that I understand your perspective better. With this expanded knowledge and confidence, they can more easily find some aspect of others with which they can connect, and this connection allows them to gain more feedback and knowledge. Again, one of my things that I talk about all the time is just humility and how leaders have to be humble, and which is actually one of the cool things that you said about Barswell, and we never talked about it, but you said, you know, hey, he was really tough, he was super smart, and he was humble. Like those, are, those are the qualities you called out. Yeah. And, and that's what this represents to me. You continue here. A, li- a leader with high cognitive ability perceives herself as being more complex than the average individual. In a decision-making situation, she might delay longer and submit a more complicated decision. Now, when I originally, originally read that right there, I had a problem with it. Because, because one of the mantras, age-old mantras of Leadership, combat leadership for sure is simplicity, right? You got to keep things simple. So I'm going to come back to that one because my immediate reaction to it was, wait a second, I don't know if I agree with that because we're talking about this person with a high cognitive ability that's coming up with a more complicated decision. But I'll get back to it here. Her interpersonal reactions, interactions tend to result in greater perceived similarities between herself and more senior people. She may perceive differences between herself and others more accurately than a leader with lower cognitive abilities does. This complex internal structure results in a greater perception of the external environmental structure which can manifest in interpersonal conflict. So again, we have someone that can that can sense what someone else's perspective is. And this is where I come back to the um, the simple thing. The high cognitive ability leader recognizes when she is communicating with others who are at a lower or higher level cognitive ability. When talking to a lower cognitive ability leader, she recognizes that person's simpler language structure, linear thought process, and shorter term focus, and will understand that the lower cognitive ability leader might not get what she's saying. So what that tells me, you take that one step further, what a really good high cognitive ability leader will do is take the complex answer and simplify it down right. so that this lower cognitive ability leader can actually understand it. 
Mm -hmm. So even though it might be a more complicated decision, the lower cognitive leader below me doesn't need to know that. They're gonna get the simplified version that they can grasp and make sense to them and then move forward. Continuing on, when she is talking to someone of equal or higher cognitive ability, she may find that the conversation moves faster and is more enjoyable and stimulating. Low cognitive ability leaders tend to use fewer dimensions when processing stimuli, resulting in fewer and less complex information domains and a lower probability of matching some facet of themselves with that of another person. And again, see, this is this is why I think it's important to, to, to talk about this because if you can't relate to other people, if you're having a hard time talking to people up the chain of command, talking to people down the chain of command, talking to your peers, if you're saying, oh, they don't get it, they don't understand, how can they think that way? If you're thinking that, if that's going through your mind, that's a little red flag that you are, that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little symbol or a, a sign of low cognitive ability. Yeah. You're the one that's not getting it. <laughs> yes. You don't, you don't understand. So <clears throat> when you get there, instead of continuing to point the finger outward, take a look at yourself and recognize the fact that there's, you need to try and find some common ground with other people. And the fact that you can't find common ground with other people is a sign that you have low cognitive ability. And that's a problem. So I'm hoping, again, I know this can't be trained, but I'm hoping that when you become aware of it, you say, oh, that's me. That's me. And this is the worst part about this whole section. The worst part about this whole section is this. What I'm hoping for is that the people with low cognitive ability will recognize that this is about them. Right? This is about me, okay? I tend to do this sometimes. I, I can't connect with other people. I, I can't see their perspective. You know what, that's, that's, my, that's me, that's on me. That's what I'm hoping people say. Unfortunately, people with low cognitive ability have a much lower chance of actually being able to recognize this. So that's the problem. It's a catch-22. Yeah, it is. Continuing, they tend to contrast themselves with others that are and are less open to feedback. Another great point. If you're not humble and you're not, again, I use the word humble. If you're not open to people telling you, hey, you know what, you could do this better, that is an actual sign of low cognitive ability. I hate to break the news to you. <laughs> The next one, in their interpersonal interactions, they tend to perceive themselves as being more similar to their peers and less similar to their superiors. They are predisposed to be more rigid and concrete in their thinking. This is another, this is something that you can recognize in yourself. This is something I can recognize in myself. When I'm going, no, we gotta do it this way. No, this is the way it's gotta be. That's an indication to me that I am tending towards low cognitive ability. And what I need to do is open my mind and try some new things, accept some new ideas. Otherwise, I'm putting myself on report for being a low cognitive thinker. Let me, let me share <clears throat> one thing. If you're a high cognitive ability person, if you become angry, the tendency is for you to start to drop in mm -hmm. levels in terms of your response right now, the interaction right now. The more angry you get, the more you drop way, really low. Mm -hmm. And when you hear people arguing, very often, you know, if they're angry, mm -hmm. <clears throat> very often they both drop way down here. And that's where, where the problem is. We got to get you back up. Mm -hmm. um, and you hear it all the time in, in meetings and between people. And you just, Listen to what they're focused on. Mm -hmm. Listen to the time frame that they're focused on. Listen to the concreteness of what they're focused on. And you, know, you, can, you can figure out where they are. Now, how can we elevate? If you and I are having this conversation, um, and I'm down here, and I'm really, I've dug my heels in. Oh, yeah. you're, just, you're just wrong, Jocko. Just, uh, you, you, there's something wrong with you. If you mm -hmm. can't see my point here. Mm -hmm. If I'm dug in down here, 
we're not gonna we're not yeah. gonna be able to resolve this. Yeah, I, I I just had a discussion <clears> like this with a client. It's like the best thing I can do when you say, I don't like this. I don't like your plan, Jocko. The best thing I can do isn't, well, that's because you don't understand it. The best thing I can say, well, hey, can you can you give me some feedback on what it is you don't like about my plan? Because now, <clears throat> instead of you digging your heels in and looking how you're gonna strike me, you're, you're actually looking to formulate a legitimate answer to a legitimate question. And by the way, when you ask that question, I'm not just asking you this question so I can trick you. No, I'm legitimately asking for feedback because maybe you know something that I don't know or maybe you see something that I don't see. So I immediately get us to start moving up that ladder again instead of down where when you say, I don't like your plan, I say that's because you're too dumb to understand it. Right. Where's that conversation going? Yeah, you just (laughs) dropped all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you continue on here. The accuracy of their predictions, this is again uh, low cognitive, the accuracy of their predictions about others is directly proportional to the amount of information they have about others. Their concreteness filters out more aspects of the external environment structure, particularly when they're under stress. Low cognitive ability leaders tend to have a relatively narrow set of interests and knowledge domains, although they may have an in-depth knowledge in a few areas. Consequently, they look for others who share one or more of their interests. Unlike the high cognitive ability leader, they do not have a broad range of areas of expertise they can use to connect with others. The bottom line is that leaders with, and, and what that tells me is, Hey, you know, I need to get outside my zone, right? Mm-hmm. Cool. I like jujitsu and I like war. But if that's the only people I hang around with, I'm not expanding my horizons. Right. So I need to go and play in a band and draw and write and hang out with people that are doing those other things as well. Mm-hmm. The bottom line is that leaders with high cognitive ability are able to possess greater amounts of information and operate more successfully in complex environments with a higher level of inconsistency and ambiguity than can leaders with low cognitive ability. As they rise to higher roles, role levels in an organization, the problems they face become more complex and ambiguous. These leaders with high cognitive ability tend to perform well at upper organizational echelons. So true. I mean, you can think about just the difference in any any job, right? Your frontline troops is concerned with, you know, this part of the manufacturing line. It's relatively, sm- not, it's not a complex thing. And then the more higher up you get in the organization, the more complex decisions are being made and whatnot. And the, the good thing is, <clears throat> when we think about cognitive ability, is there's a place for everyone. You have a real need for everyone. Someone has to do that day-to-day, hour-to-hour work. Mm-hmm. And be happy with it. Be mm-hmm. good. Be happy. And go home at the end of the day saying, yes, I knocked that out of the park. Mm-hmm. Above them, you need somebody with a little bit more that's really good at that level. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so getting the right person into the right role level mm-hmm. at the right time. Because if we think about cognitive ability for a lot of people is, is continuing to change. So there's like a, a growth curve right. that you can see. It'll flatten out someplace. But as long as they're growing, <clears throat> they can take on higher and higher roll levels right. uh, as they, they cross those different thresholds. But eventually they're going to hit a point where, I mean, this is it. Yeah. They need to be happy here because if you move them up to the next one, they're going to fail. Yeah, and what I f- see with people is – there's a certain spot where they go, yeah, this is where I'm at and I'm comfortable in this area, not comfortable in a bad way of like, oh, in my comfort zone, but you start to move them outside that cognitive ability level and all of a sudden they're stressed Yes, because they're trying to make decisions on inconsistent information and it's too much. And you know what? That's that's like you just said, that's actually good because now we know what the limitations are and now you can focus on this, this cognitive ability level where you excel at because by the way you get somebody with really good cognitive ability and you put them in a job that 
doesn't require as much, well, now they're going to be bored. And you use a term in this book, which I had never actually heard before. It's uh, not burnout. It's the opposite of burnout. It's called rust out. So that's all good. And like I said, we work with all kinds of organizations. And the other interesting point I got to make is the the cognitive ability isn't doesn't measure your intelligence. It measures a bunch of different things that, and and just like some people are more articulate and some people are taller and some people are shorter, like this is one of those things where it's some components combined together, and you could have somebody that went to an Ivy League school, and I know I got to see this in the SEAL teams. People that went to Ivy League schools, they scored super high on whatever IQ test there are. Their cognitive ability is not high because they can't look at complex things, they get wrapped around minutia or whatever the case may be. So this is a, a really interesting thing. I would like to think, and maybe it's just because I'm a positive thinking person, I would like to think that if a person has humility and they say, you know what, when I hear that my, that, that when I hear it being described that having concrete ideas probably means that my cognitive ability is a little lower. Maybe I need to open my mind up a little bit. And maybe they can. I know that I saw leaders, and I still see leaders. I know for a fact I see leaders get better, become better leaders, and and be able to look at complex things and, and start to understand that information doesn't need to be perfect. And even if I look at myself, when I was when I first got to the SEAL teams and I was a new guy, I couldn't look at a complex problem immediately and go, oh, okay, you know what? Oh, that these two pieces of information are kind of different, but I can make a, a sound decision that will make sense right now and we can make some adaptations later. Got it. No, I would have been looking for, hey, what's the, is this right or is that right? I don't know which one. Okay, I got to move forward with it. So I think that that idea that you can improve it is a positive thing, even though, I don't know, does that mean it's trainable? What happens is I, I'm i growing and I cross a threshold um, and I don't realize it. I don't realize that I have more ability all of a sudden because it, it's like a stair step. Mm-hmm. It jumps up, it goes along, it jumps up. And when it makes that jump, I might not realize it initially. And so I might need a coach. I might need you to come in and work with me to help me start to use this this increased ability that I have, mm-hmm. because I don't I don't realize how to do it. So you know we work with leaders a lot, uh, helping them be able to take advantage of the abilities that they have, because a lot of times they don't know it. Mm-hmm. They don't know they can yeah. handle more ambiguity. They can think <laughs> further into the future because in their job they're not allowed to. Yeah. You're in a role level where they they keep pulling you back down to here, uh, even though you have a lot more ability. So one of the things that, that we're looking at uh, with people in an organization is, are you working at your potential? Mm-hmm. Do you have unused potential? That if we could help you to start to use it, you raise the whole bar for the organization. Performance level for the organization goes up. You know, because now you're operating closer to your full potential than you were before. So. We were doing immediate action drills. I was tasking unit commander, the platoon <coughs> commander. My two, two platoon commanders were Seth and Leif. Leif wrote the books with me. Seth was the other platoon commander, the Delta platoon commander. And you know the deal with immediate action drills. There's a, there's a standard operating procedure. There's a place where you're going to go on a peel left, on a peel right, on a center peel, on a flank right, on a flank left. Uh, there's there's positions for you to go into. And so I was watching him and his platoon, and basically the call would get made, whether it was him or whether it was the leading petty officer or whoever, someone would make a call, and I'd watch him, and he would, he would stay like in the precise position that the standard operating procedure dictates him to be in. And so, which meant that if he ran down a ravine and was facing the, the six foot wall of a ravine, ravine and couldn't see anything, he was gonna stand there because that's where he was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And I said, hey man, what can you see right now? You know, it's like, well, nothing. Well, why don't you move a little bit? Well, because that's not the standard operating procedure. Well, guess what? You're the platoon commander. It's okay. You can have someone fill in here, right? And you can go and you can crawl up this little this little part of the ravine and you can actually see maybe an out where you can direct your guys so you can get out of this 
cone of fire. How does that sound? So that becoming aware that you're allowed to move, that you're allowed to think, that you're allowed to take action, reminds me of what you just said about a leader being able to step up, suddenly realizing that, like a mm-hmm. stair step up. As soon as he realized that, he's like, oh, oh, I can move around. And yes, as a leader, yes, you can. Um, talk about emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence focuses on the interpersonal and emotional aspects of innate ability. It can be defined as a person's innate ability to perceive and manage his own perceptions in a manner that results in successful interactions with the environment and, if others are present, to perceive and manage their emotions in a manner that result in successful interpersonal reactions. Emotional intelligence. Being able to read people. You talk about the innate ability to do this, but can you learn it? To some degree. Okay, good. I'm glad you said that because I've talked to people and helped people. Yeah. Like, let me give you a big hint on emotional intelligence to anyone that's listening. If you want to get better at it, here's a good step to take. Be quiet and listen to what people are saying. (laughs) (laughs) You know, when you actually shut your mouth and listen, People will, and and you truly listen to what they're saying, you can hear what their tone sounds like and pay attention to it. You can watch their facial expressions and pay attention to it. You can watch their body language and pay attention to it. When you're not listening, when you're on transmit instead of receive, you're not gonna, you're not gonna perceive as much about their emotional state at that time, which means you're gonna react badly to it. So instead of being on transmit mode, for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, when you're on a radio, as a radio man, when you're pressing the push to talk button, you're transmitting information. Don't be on transmit, be on receive. That's my advice. That'll improve your emotional intelligence in the next five minutes. <laughs> uh, motivation. Motivation is a combination of work, aspiration, the role, level, the role level the leader aspires to reach, motivators, what drives the leader to be fully engaged at work, demotivators, what causes the leader to lose interest in work, and drive for results the leaders need to achieve. In general, motivation is highly associated with job performance and promotability. I think uh, Jordan Peterson calls this conscientiousness. Like, are you going to do your job? Mm -hmm. Personality, a leader's personality tends to be hardwired so that most of his core preferences for interacting with people, gathering information, decision-making, and general orientation to life change little over the course of his life. You kind of get what you get. Yeah. How often do you see people's personalities change? Not much. We're we're asked all the time, Mm -hmm. you got got to fix. Yeah. Echo Charles, you got you got to fix him, mm-hmm. and and we tell him, you know, we can work with him, yeah. we can smooth off some of the edges, yeah, but he's still going to be Echo Charles yeah. when when the dust settles, that's because a, that, that's who he is. That's a sad fact that I've been dealing with for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> Here, here's here's what I have here's what I have seen. One, th- th- I have seen people change personality from some kind of event that takes place in their life, like usually a traumatic event. Something happens, bad, good, um, chance, luck, and they they end up, it's not gonna drastically change their personality. Because over time, people will be, the gravity of their personality will draw them back to who they are. Mm -hmm. But occasionally, the times that I've seen personalities change the most is something happens and that changes their personality. But it's hard. It's hard to change. It's hard to truly change someone. You know yeah. the that story about the what is it? The frog and the scorpion. And the frog says, "I'll take you over." Or right. the scorpion says, "Can we take me over?" And he says, "No. If I take you over the river, you'll you'll sting me, and I'll die." And he says, "No. Why would I do that? We'd both die." And they go across. And of course, the scorpion stings. He says, "Why'd you do that?" Because I'm a scorpion. What'd you think I was going to do? <laughs> so, uh, the fundamental core of leadership is decision making. Everything a leader does or does not do is the result of decisions. Everyday leaders are called upon to make decisions, routine and non-routine. And then you say problem solving is just a series of decisions. Good point. You have these steps, the seven step problem solving model. One, identify the problem. Two, gather the information. 
Three, redefine the problem. Four, generate alternatives, courses of action. Five, evaluate alternatives. Six, select and implement the solution. Seven, evaluate the results. And then back to one again. So that's what we're doing all the time. And you talk about the OODA loop in here, which we've talked about a bunch on the, on the on this podcast. Um, and then you talk about the other, the loop that, what is it, the PAMA loop. Mm-hmm. What's that loop? That's where you're perceiving information. Which is, so this one reminded me of the OODA loop, right? They're, they're very similar. To some degree, yeah. Okay. So you perceive information. Mm-hmm. It comes into your system. You appraise it. You know, make sense out of it. Which is like orient, right? So yeah, observe, yeah, orient. Yeah. So those two are pretty close, right? Yeah. Perceive and and uh, observe would be the P and the O. And then you get to A, which is, what is it in the PAMA? What does it stand for? Assess? Uh, appraise. Appraise. And that's very similar to orient. Mm-hmm. Okay, then what's the M? Yeah, then we, we get into to the motivational part, and then we, we get to get into uh, the action, mm-hmm. and then we're back in the loop again. Yeah, and, and even the last one is action yeah. in the PAM loop, and in, and in the OOD loop, it's act. Right. So you go through, uh, uh, you know, kind of dissecting what these two, the differences are, the similarities, and that's, that's definitely a... Uh, an interesting thing, because again, see, for me, I always have this, I guess, positive outlook on things that if you know something, you can at least try and apply it, right? So people do the OODA loop, mm-hmm. people do the PAMA loop, but they don't know it. And so therefore, when they miss it, or they do it, or they or they get caught in some meaningless cycle of it, if they don't know that that's what they're doing, they can't even correct it. But if you're aware, oh, you know what? I'm I'm not acting. That's why I'm sitting here. I'm not acting. So I need to I need to take action. So I think being aware of things just like being aware of low cognitive ability, if you're aware of it, even if you're aware of it, hopefully you can make some adjustments in your mm-hmm. life to get it moving in the right direction. You talk about um rational strategies, which is logical, sequential, analytical conscious, well-thought-out process that takes time and typically involves others. So this is, hey, we're going to come up with a rational decision for our problem. And the other one is intuitive, which is intuitive decisions are made quickly, automatically, emotionally, mostly uh, unconsciously. And this is the type of decision usually made in routine or emergency situations. So... These, again, these are two, if you understand these two things, that you can make a rational decision or you can make an intuitive decision and understand what the shortfalls of each are because you can make too rational of a decision, right? You can yeah. analyze things to death or you can just look at the numbers or and you just make that kind of decision. It can be wrong. Or you can make an intuitive decision, which can also be wrong. Right. And it can be right. So what are the shortnesses? And this is, again, um, stuff that you cover in depth in this book, um, which is very a very interesting book, and I believe will raise people's awareness and make them more capable of making decisions. And by the way, right now, this is page 35 in the book. The book is actually called The Stress Effect, How Why Smart Leaders Make Dumb Decisions and What to Do About It. So all you've done up until this point is explaining what types of leaders there are, what types of decisions are being made, so that way you can then explain what stress is and what stress does to your decision-making process, many of the things of which we've already talked about. Yeah. Uh, Stress destroys your decision-making process. As the stress level goes up, uh, your cognitive ability goes down, your emotional intelligence goes down, the quality of your decision-making goes down. So managing stress is really key. Uh, If you're in a combat situation, you're going to make a lot of intuitive decisions. When I get on my feet and I look and I see there are two NVA standing there and they look at me and they turn their weapons, I'm not going to say, okay, mm-hmm. let me see here now. Uh, what what do I think the problem is? Let me are, are those NVA, what's going to happen? And I don't work through that big problem-solving process. Mm-hmm. I see it. 
I see the answer, I pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. And I've got to do it. I've got to do it. Yeah, that's absolutely very quickly. the right answer. And, but when I ask somebody, and I do this all the time, somebody will talk about a decision like that, and when I say, how did you make that decision? They immediately launch into that problem-solving model. And I said, you did it in less than two seconds. <laughs> you, you didn't have time to do all of those things. What you're doing is you're using the solution that's sitting on the top of, of what I call a dominant response hierarchy. You have trained and trained and trained to produce a certain response. When you see them, squeeze the trigger as you're going down. Mm -hmm. you, that's setting up there, and that's what you're gonna execute. Uh, if you wanna execute a different plan, you're gonna have to train in something else up there mm -hmm. uh, because it's gonna come so fast. And, and that's, how, that's how you survive in a life and death situation. You gotta make a decision, mm -hmm. and you gotta do it very quickly. And if, if you have time, uh, you got a week or so to make a decision, you can bring your team in, you can work through that problem-solving model, and you know, come up with a, with a good decision. Mm -hmm. If you got two seconds, you can't do that. You got it intuitive because it's so much faster, but it's gonna grab whatever's setting at the top. So you better be training for the right response. And that's where the training comes mm -hmm. in, over and over and over, and that's automatic. When you, when you uh, watch pro athletes, <clears throat> they train all the time, and they train for particular uh, responses, and that's why they can do it so fast. You, mm -hmm. If you like to play golf, and you play golf with someone, uh, if you want to give yourself an advantage, and, and the guy you're playing with is a, a really good putter, uh, so you get on the green, and you say, Jocko, I have always been impressed with your ability to make those long putts. I mean, we're friends. Mm -hmm. Help me out here. Tell me what you think about. I mean, when you're getting ready to putt, talk, talk me through the steps that you go through to make that putt. He's going to blow it because mm -hmm. now he's thinking mm -hmm. rather than executing. You know, pros execute. It's automatic. They don't have to think about it. You make mm -hmm. them think about it, they'll blow it. When singers are singing a national anthem or something, <laughs> if they make the mistake of thinking about what words coming next in the lyrics, they're gonna blow it. Yeah. Right. You, it's got to be automatic. I uh, <coughs> well, we we train a lot of jujitsu, and so, you know, I talk about jujitsu with the laws of combat and leadership and life and how it all is inter intertwined. And a guy said to me, hey, what? how does decentralized command fit into jujitsu? I don't see where the, I see where prioritize and execute is, I see where simple is, I see where cover and move is, I see where those are in jujitsu, but where's decentralized command? And I said, here's exactly where it is. You need to train enough that your body parts know to execute without being told what to do. Mm -hmm. So when it comes time to defend your arm, you need to move that arm. You don't have time to think about it. Just like you don't have time to tell the platoon commander or the squad leader, hey, take and put down cover fire as we move to the flank. No, they've got to have the instinct to make that happen without you needing to tell them. So that's where decentralized command comes in to your, to your jiu-jitsu game. Um, you talk about this recognition prime decision model or RPD. And just hitting a couple things here. Here's what you do, assess the situation, evaluate a course of action, select an option, develop a solution set, generate and evaluate options, adjust the option, take action. And again, these are very similar ideas, but there's little nuances that you spell out pretty, that you spell out inside the book. Here's one, the technique of sufficing allows a solution to be chosen that is not perfect, but is sufficient to provide a satisfactory solution to the problem. The RPD model chooses the first solution that might work, a sufficing approach. Um, in most cases, trying to choose a solution using a maximizing, which is optimal or perfect approach, tends to be unrealistic and inefficient because the leader is making decisions in an environment where all the information about the problem and possible solutions are unknown. So this is a great thing that I think I have always used. Sufficing, like, yeah, that's the solution. It's gonna be good enough, we need to go with it. Mm -hmm. 
you talk about cognitive intelligence, and now this is a little bit different. Cognitive intelligence, a very general mental capability that among other things involves the ability to reason, plan, solve problems, think abstractly, comprehend complex ideas, learn quickly, and learn from experience. It is not merely book learning, a narrow academic skill, or test-taking smarts. Rather, it reflects a broader and deeper capability for comprehending our surroundings. And then there's these terms, catching on, making sense of things, or figuring out what to do. So this is a different type of intelligence, which obviously is very important. That definition is an excellent starting point for about for thinking about leadership and decision making, especially the last point about f- a figuring out. Cognitive intelligence doesn't begin and end with having some smarts. An individual must know what to do with his or her cognitive intelligence. And this is once again, you get these smart young officers that, and at a certain point in the SEAL teams, I mean, we were getting these incredibly qualified on paper individuals that were, you know, they, they should be the smartest people in the, in the world. But you'd see them have problems. Not all of them, of course, some of them were great. You know, Some of the guys went to Harvard and Yale and everywhere else and they were fantastic. But some of them, it wasn't all like that. It wasn't across the board. And that's exactly what you're talking about here. You gotta, you gotta be smart, but you gotta do, know what to do with those smarts. Um, just some of the, some of the things that, that the cognitive intelligence, uh, some, of the, some of the abilities that includes fluid reasoning crystallized intelligence, visual processing, auditory processing, processing speed, short-term memory, long-term retrieval, quantitative knowledge, correct decision speed. Again, these are, as you think about these things, and if you're a humble person, you'll think to yourself, you know what? I I need to learn to, I need to, I don't process things very well. What, What should I do to counter that? Maybe I should prepare more. Maybe I should study more. My my auditory processing. Hey, how well do I actually listen? What can I do to improve my listening skills? If you don't admit that you don't listen well, you're not going to get any better at it. Um, cognitive intelligence moderating factors when all things aren't easy. So, so here's some things that you talk about when it comes to cognitive intelligence, the factors that come into play. One of them is environment. And you, you've got a very interesting study. and You've got all kinds of studies in here. But one of them was like they looked at um, groups of kids that they gave better opportunities <clears throat> for to. You know, like low-income kids, they gave g- really good opportunities to some and didn't give them to the other ones. And it actually didn't have that much of an effect, which surprised me. Like there was a little bump in the beginning, but then it just leveled out. Most, most of those studies... Are short-term studies, and so they they create those environments. Um, you know, a few months later they test and they say, "Wow, uh, this group really improved." But then they don't come back two years later, three years later. Uh, when you find those studies, they everybody's back to the same yeah. as as they get older. By the time kids are fifteen, uh, most of the stuff. This enriched environment kind of work that you do with them when they're they're young, everybody's back to the same. I mean, by the, mm-hmm. they've all matured back to the same place. Um, so you you can't just look at what happens the first few months, but yeah. nobody wants to do that. They want to publish their study and we'll move on. <laughs> hey, I got great results. It worked. They want to sell you the uh, Einstein music for your kids, oh, yeah. Yeah. Baby Einstein or yep. whatever it's called. Yep. Baby Einstein. Little Einstein. Little Einstein, yeah. You talk about age. Um, Here's some things if you want to help preserve cognitive intelligence. Um, Cardiovascular, the absence, here's some things that, that, that 
specific factors that seem to help preserve cognitive intelligence as people age. The absence of cardiovascular and other chronic diseases, a favorable environment, above average education, occupational pursuits, pursuits involving high complexity and low routine, above average income, and the maintenance of intact families, a complex and intellectually stimulating environment, a flexible personality style at midlife, being married to a spouse with high cognitive intelligence, maintenance of high levels of perceptual processing speed, being satisfied with life's accomplishments. Important things. And and some of those things are hard for you to do. I mean, they happen. Mm -hmm. The most important thing that you can do to maintain your uh, cognitive ability, your intellectual uh, ability, is aerobic exercise. Mm -hmm. Nothing has been proven long-term to have a greater impact on your how your brain's operating, particularly um, delaying the onset of dementia or Alzheimer's, nothing does better than aerobic exercise, where you're pumping the blood, you're pumping uh, the food into your brain, you're cleaning your brain out. Um, aerobic exercise is going to do it for you. Good, good information. <sighs> talk about memory, yeah, and then you talk about physical conditioning which I'm a big supporter of. Nutrition, obviously, if you're not eating clean. Sleep, getting good sleep. There's there's one of my uh, weaknesses. I don't sleep very much. Cognitive intelligence can be a double-edged sword. A leader with high cognitive intelligence can possess can process information rapidly, solve complex problems quickly, and make effective decisions. He might also be perceived by his team as arrogant, condescending and impatient. The leader knows he can do the work better and faster than his team members and may forget sometimes that they don't have his ability. This is one of those where I'm worried about saying that one because what this does is it makes someone say, well, you know, people think I'm arrogant because I'm so smart because I have high (laughs) cognitive ability. That's everyone else's problem. But as I've said to many smart people, people over the years if you're so smart why aren't you winning (laughs) yeah yeah i mean we see it all the time that double-edged sword you come across as a jerk you come across as arrogant um and you you're condescending toward people what's taking you so long Mm -hmm. i mean this is simple (laughs) well for you it might be but for the average person it's not Mm -hmm. then when you start putting that kind of feedback out you're just taking too long i don't understand what's wrong with you yeah Uh, yeah, you're just killing their motivation and causing them to see you more as a jerk yep that's that's gonna hurt your leadership capital talking a little bit about emotion here all human decisions have some emotional component that's the way the brain is wired as you're about to see the more a leader understands the emotional component of decision making the more effective her decisions can become Emotions happen. Emotions are neural impulses that happen inside the brain and trigger a motivation to reach a goal. Emotions are goal oriented. Whenever you try, whenever you experience emotion, there is an end goal that the emotion is trying to move you toward. Emotions have their beginning in the unconscious and most of them stay there. When an emotion becomes conscious, we have a feeling. For example, when the emotion of fear becomes conscious, I feel scared. Emotions can be viewed as providing situational reports about what is happening in the body. Why am I shaking? I feel scared. Emotions have survival value. David Caruso and Peter Salovey, researchers and and educators, provide the following linkages between emotions and survival. Fear, from a survival standpoint, is let's get out of here. Sadness is help me. Disgust is don't eat that. Anger is about fighting. When you get angry, your anger raises your energy level to overcome an obstacle in your path. So there you go. You gotta recognize what's going on with these emotions. Emotional intelligence has always been present and identified, but not valued as intelligence. 
1995, Daniel Goldman brought emotional intelligence into the world's consciousness with the publication of his best-selling book, Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ. His books quickly spawned a proliferation of, of articles, books, workshops, training materials, assessments, and conferences on emotional intelligence. A cottage in industry sprang up almost overnight. The term emotional intelligence is used to describe a non-cognitive type of intelligence. I define it as a person's innate ability to perceive and manage his or own, her own emotions in a manner that results in successful interactions with the environment and, if others are present, to also perceive and manage their emotions in a manner that results in successful interpersonal interactions. Note that this definition does not require interaction with another person. Emotional intelligence involves managing and controlling the awareness and appraising of emotions and the resulting motivation and action in a manner that produces successful outcomes, whether in the presence or absence of others. As a leader, I need to understand my emotions and how they impact me and what it causes me to do or how I can use it. I need to understand yours so that if I want you to proof a document for me, mm-hmm. if I make you really happy and then say proof this, you'll miss most of the typos. <laughs> if I make you irritated, you'll find them all. You'll rip it apart. If there's something in there, you'll find it. So understanding the impact that the emotions are having on you and your performance and, and which way it, it drives you, you know, that's using emotional intelligence to be successful, to help you be successful. Um, you know, same on the battlefield. I need to understand the emotions that you're probably going to experience and what are they going to do to you? How do you need to adapt them? How do you need to redirect them? Understanding that fear takes away you know, your fine motor skills. So, and I need to train you to be able to operate without those fine motor skills, to be able to use the gross motor skills and still perform just as well. You just have to perform the task a little differently. Mm -hmm. So shoot without aiming. You learn the the quick kill technique. You talk about um, hijackers of emotional intelligence. When the hijacking occurs, it sets up an opportunity for your evil twin, Skippy, to come forward. Skippy is the bad side of you who says and does things that are uncharacteristic of you. It was not Mike Tyson who bit off a piece of Evander Holyfield's ear during a championship fight in 1997. It was Tyson's evil twin, Skippy. So then you just go on to describe the fact that you've got to keep your emotions in check. And (laughs) something we we all need to look out for, especially Mike Tyson. (laughs) Um, stress interferes with decision making and again now you know I've already talked about a bunch of stuff and now we're sort of getting into the meat, some of the book more control equals less stress I, I really like this part data collected over the years on stress levels within the baboon population reveal that a, the higher a baboon is in the hierarchy the less stress he experiences this re- these results suggest that the amount of control you have over your situation influences the amount of stress you experience. Just to give you an example, uh, in the in the old days with a SOG team, you got on a helicopter, you flew out to do your insertion, uh, you found out what was going on at the LZ when you got there, and one day I asked uh, the crew chief, I said you've got an extra headset up here. Can I wear that headset? And he said, sure. So when I put the headset on, all of a sudden I'm listening to Cubby talk. I'm listening to our gunships talk. I'm listening about what's going on at the LZ. Are they prepping it? Are they seeing anything? Did they receive an aircraft fire on the way out there? Um, If the LZ is hot, I know it. I know which side is hot, and I may have a plan that we're going to exit the aircraft and and go east. I really need to go west. All of a sudden, I've got all this information that I can use to make decisions, and I could just literally feel my stress level coming down. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand what's going on now. I don't have to figure it out in two seconds when I get there and I'm being shot at. Now I've got a plan. Um, So giving myself control, I don't know why we didn't do that right from the beginning mm-hmm. but I, I know for me once I 
once I, I could get access to that information, it just made all the difference in the world. Yeah. There was a like, study, and I'm trying to remember it all. It was something about, like, I think, I don't know if they use cats or people or what, but it was like they'd get a shock. No, this is the rats. Okay, I rats. talked about this at the muster. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. so they'd, they'd shock them with, a, like, a certain strength, right, of shock? No, so this is the deal. There's a cage yeah. with two sides to the cage. Each of the, each of the floors in the cage deliver a shock. One of them has a stronger shock but there's a light that comes on before the shock goes off. And so they're, they're able to like expect it and yeah, understand it. Yeah, they know it. when it's coming. The other side, less of a shock, but it's just completely random. And there's a, there's a pathway to get between the two areas, but you can't like hang out there. So the, the, the rats basically have to decide which side they wanna be on. The stronger shock that they are prepared for or the random shock that's less. And the rats always pick the the side that has the warning, so they know what's going on. Yeah. Even and, though it's worse. Yeah, even no, though it's worse. Yeah. I, I I just talked about this. I was talking to some army troops out in Hawaii, as a matter of fact, and talking about you know you mentioned earlier that the the thing that you can take away from troops that they care about money more than money and rank is freedom. Contrary to that, or or I guess the the other side of that is the best thing you can reward someone with is more freedom in the form of, and one you can do it at work because you can only give someone so much free time, but you say, give them control over the exercise, give them control mm-hmm. over the training, give them control over what time they get done, give them control over where they go. The more control people have, the, the, the more satisfied they are, the better they're gonna perform. And so that way you can use that, you can, you can take control away from them and that's the worst punishment you can give them. The best reward you can give somebody is give them freedom, give them control over their fate. I think that's the most powerful driver. I think that even drives people generally more than money. Mm-hmm. Um, so I talk about that with companies that they, you know, we, we, we can't afford to pay anyone. It's the same, we can't afford to pay our employees more than X or we'll go bankrupt or in the military, I can't go and, you know, I can't pay my corporals more. It doesn't work right. that way. What do you do? How do you reward them? You give them freedom. You give them control over their destiny. That will drive people and it's the best thing you can use. Um, but that stress element, like it's almost, a, even in jiu-jitsu you have that if you compete in jiu-jitsu, if you don't know like when you're gonna go on, you know, cause it's like, oh, I'm supposed oh, yeah. to go on right now, but then they're not calling your name and you're like, you get all stressed. But then if you know, oh, it's your time, then you're like less stressed. It's almost like if you're in the dark about something, you're just more stressed. Right. So the more information you have about it, so that's why like people when they're worried, they're like asking all these questions, like how's it gonna go? They just wanna know how it's gonna go, you know? So yeah, that makes sense, I feel that. Check out this dichotomy. A lot of people think dichotomy is my favorite word, but. It is. <laughs> check out this dichotomy. As the number of choices increases, the autonomy, control, and liberation this variety brings us is powerful and positive. But if the number of choices keeps growing, negative effects start to appear. As choices grow further, the negatives escalate until we become overloaded. At this point, choice no longer liberates us. It might even ter- be said to tyrannize. Mm-hmm. So that's why discipline will give you freedom. And that's why giving someone, you know, if you have too many options, it, yeah. it can turn out to be a bad thing. There's a definite dichotomy there. <laughs> Here's another, again, I'm jumping around a bit. Um, A key point to remember is that all models, whether mental, physical, mathematical, or iconic, have blind spots. When you choose a model, you choose your blind spots. That's powerful. So whatever you're thinking, you're not necessarily, you're not gonna be 100% right. There's gonna be things that you don't see, that you don't understand, that you miss. And what's critical is understand the models understand the one that you choose and so what are the blind spots that I've just chosen what am I not going to see by using this and whenever you can if you can use multiple lenses and and we do that a lot when we're assessing people um, I don't want just this one assessment instrument because it's got all kind of blind spots (laughs) so I pick another one that's going to close some of those blind spots because it covers those and you know so I get a, a better picture of what you look like by using multiple lenses to look at you with. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't have just one. I give you this one test, 
I don't. I miss all this stuff over here. And, so. and and by the way, if you don't have a high cognitive ability, when you see these two reports about someone that might have contrasting mm-hmm. information, you yep. won't be able to. Oh, this report doesn't yep. make any sense, yep. and you'll lean towards the one that makes the most sense to you. That mm-hmm. fills the vision that you've been looking for. Here's the thing that I just had to read. Catastrophic, when catastrophic leadership failures occur, it is sudden and causes a catastrophic change in the leader's ability to perform successfully. The leader will exhibit some or all of a characteristic characteristic set of behaviors. And here's those behaviors. And this is to me, these are like red flags. These are things that if you're paying attention right now and you're listening and you want to improve your leadership capabilities, Pay attention to these things, and when you notice yourself doing them, check yourself, detach, take a step back, and and correct your 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 trajectory because your mm-hmm. trajectory is not good. Number one, not listening. That's number one, not listening, over analyzing, failure to make decisions, low quality decisions, emotional decisions, flip flops, short term decisions and focus, reactive decisions, defensiveness rationalizing, self-satisfying, hedonism, denial, inattentional blindness, fear-based decisions, anger-facilitated decisions, automatic decision-making, and mental paralysis. So there's a list of things that you can identify about yourself when there's a stressful situation going on and you start making a rational decision or you start making an emotional decision or you're not listening to anybody else anymore. Time to take a step back, detach, and get yourself, get your mind right, because it's not right to make decisions at that point. Um, These are similar list of behaviors that will get you thinking about how you behave in stressful situations. Aggression, loss of humor, taking offense. Isn't that a great one? We take offense, right? And that's a sign that says, oh, you're stressed out and you're not about to make a good decision. And in my opinion, when you're taking offense, there's, that's rooted to something that we call ego. It's gonna be something that's brushing up against your ego. Here's another one, wanting to be right. Oh, that's also ego. Wanting the last word, that's also ego. Flooding with information to prove a point. That's ego. (laughs) Holding a grudge. That's ego. I know that. That's ego. Jealousy. That's ego. Playing poor me. Sarcasm. Blaming. Being too nice. That's an interesting one. Being too nice. You're just going to, okay, yeah, I'll do it. It's like, oh, you just broke. So there's a dichotomy, right? One of them is one of them is we're getting aggressive. The other one is I'm just cow, cowering down. Mm. There's a little dichotomy there. If you're doing well, you'll be balanced. Um, here's here's Echo's favorite. It's my it's my personality. It's just the way I am. <laughs> uh, don't lecture me. These are all just classic, just classic things that you do that should be signs that you're you're not doing well. <laughs> <laughs> Chronic stress is a constant drain on a leader's overall capacity. Accidentally leaving the car light on begins to drain the car battery. Here you do a great job of you know, talking about the comfort zone, and we don't want to be in the comfort zone all the time. We want to be pushing out of it a little bit. That, that forces us to, to step up our game. But if we spend too much time up there out of the comfort zone, we'll get burned out because right. we're having to be undergoing all this stress all the time. The other one I already talked about is rust out, and that's when you're, you're just you're doing something that's too easy. It's not challenging. You're you're so deep in your comfort zone. It's so easy for you that you don't care about it anymore. Mm-hmm. The further the leader moves into the burnout zone, the faster he will burn out. His performance, job satisfaction, interpersonal relationships, motivation, and health will begin to deteriorate. Dropping below the comfort zone takes the leader to into the rust out zone. There, the leader will experience boredom, loss of motivation, and lowered sense of purpose. So those are important things to look for with your troops. You see someone that's bored, not motivated, cool, put them in a leadership position, let them step up. 
stress is not just a nuisance designed to frustrate humans and shorten their lives. And this is, again, I'm jumping through this book. Quite the opposite. The purpose of stress is to help people increase their odds of survival by providing quicker response time, more alertness, and the ability to focus more narrowly on the environment. The trick is to keep stress as an ally, not an enemy. So stress is not bad. It's not necessarily bad all the time. Right. It, it will right. make you better with with some as long as you get breaks from it yeah and and you can you can adapt to stress so it's like you know if you if you lift weights you and you're going to do curls uh Hell and you yeah. get so you, Ec- echo approves of this yeah this so, example. so you can uh, you can get so you're using 35 pounds and you're doing 10 reps and if you just keep doing 10 reps for 35 pounds every day you don't get better. Mm-hmm. What you have to do is stress yourself. <clears throat> so you have to <coughs> excuse me, increase the weight. You can increase the reps, adapt to it. Then you increase again. And what, what your body's doing is adapting to that stress mm-hmm. uh, a little at a time. Mm-hmm. So you keep it within a range that it can adapt to, and you'll keep getting stronger and stronger. Same with running. You don't go out and run 26 miles the first day. You kind of build up to it. And you're, you know, so you're stressing the body as you run longer distances or if you run hills or you know, you're running sprints. You do a, a series of things that stress you to help you get so you can go farther and you can go faster. Mm-hmm. And eventually you can do the 26 miles. Uh, but if you just you run three miles every day at the same pace, you're going to max out right mm-hmm. there. And the 26, it would just eat your lunch when you try it. Uh, you know, this is, this is I, when I was talking about me being, you know, <coughs> having a positive attitude earlier, being an optimist. And I was thinking about this quote because I knew I was going to get to it. When Collins asked Stockdale, this is Admiral Stockdale, who's a POW. <coughs> when Collins asked Stockdale which POWs didn't make it out, Stockdale responded, that's easy. The optimists. The optimists were the prisoners who believed that, believed and would say that the North Vietnamese were going to release the POWs by Christmas. When it didn't happen by Christmas, they would say it would happen by Easter, then Thanksgiving. Eventually, the optimists would die of a broken heart. The solution, according to Stockdale, is that you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality whatever they may be that's important right there yeah (laughs) um we say in the 1980s i worked at the center for army leadership at fort leavenworth kansas a subject matter expert on leadership and stress on the battlefield Uh, Research indicated that people high in psychological hardiness differed from people with low psychological hardiness in four primary ways a stronger commitment to self an attitude of vigorousness toward the environment, a sense of meaningfulness, and an internal sense of control. Continued research narrowed these differences to three factors. (laughs) Commitment, the ability to feel deeply involved in life's activities. Control, the belief that you can control or influence stressful events in your life. And challenge the anticipation of change as an exciting challenge for further development. Yeah, those are those are key. That challenge thing, instead of looking at everything like, "Oh no, this is happening to me," and instead saying, "Oh, this is oh, this is an opportunity for us." I, you know, I had some client ask me the other day, "Well, what would you do, you know, if your if your team got assigned like the hardest job, and how are you going to break the news to them?" You know, and I said, "Oh, we got assigned the hardest job. I'm going to walk in there and be like, hey, guys, guess what?'" This company knows that there's only one team that can get this done. And they're saying it's going to take three months to get it done. And guess what? We're going to get it done in two months. And it's going to take everything we've got, but we are going to crush this thing. And we're going to show not only we're the only team that can do this, we're the only team that can do absolutely anything. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, because that's the attitude you got to have. This isn't a challenge that we're going to shy away from. This is an opportunity for us to to get after it. Um, 
Most people who study resilience agree on a core set of common factors. Flexibility, adaptability, meaning, value, determination, strength, and recovery. So talking about resilience, those are some things to think about. That flexibility one isn't one that you might think of. It's a little counterintuitive to think, well, I'm resilient, so I just keep going the same direction. It's like, no, actually, I'm flexible, and I'm going to adapt. Got to adapt. As opposed to burning yourself out, beating your head against the wall. Um, you talk about this this um, acronym you use here: stress resilient emotional intelligence, the ability to resist the negative influence of stress on the emotional aspects of decision making by flexing and adapting to sudden change. As the stress level goes up, particularly toward the extreme level, people lose their access to emotional intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> oh. If you can't take a step back and take a breath and get control of your emotions, you're going to have problems. There's no doubt about that. You have to learn how to breathe. <clears throat> breathing is a big deal. Tactical breathing, where you inhale for four seconds, mm-hmm. you pause and you exhale four seconds. Uh, very quickly, that will help calm you down, slows your heart rate back down. Um, we used it with sniper training. Mm-hmm. You know, when when you're reaching out those distances like they do today, you know, with a 50 caliber, you know, I mean, you can reach out and touch somebody two miles away. <laughs> but the pressure of the pulse in your finger is enough to change the trajectory to cause you to miss it. Mm-hmm. So slowing your heart rate down, um, causing it to be a little weaker, being very controlled, and squeezing it off. And, you know, the Canadian guy, I don't remember his name right now, I think he has the record of, of a kill at like 2.2 miles. Mm-hmm. That's a crazy <clears> shot <throat> right there. That's a long way. <laughs> but you know, there are ways to do that. Yeah, I always talk about the fact that um, it was always our goal to, to n- never sound excited on the radio. Mm-hmm. And in order to do that, you're going to have to get control of your breath. When you get control of your breath and you get control of your voice, that just calms you down. Instead of, hey, we need help over here. Just, hey, we're gonna need two more guys down this hallway, please. That's a way to stay calm. <laughs> uh, you get in here to the seven best practices to prevent stress. And it said, a leader can get caught in an ever accelerating downward spiral and it starts with rising levels of stress. At first, the leader might think, I can power through this, I'm tough. That's how I got to where I am. But this, as his stress levels begin to rise, he finds it more and more difficult to maintain the lifestyle that helps keep his stress manageable. The diet quickly turns unhealthy. There's no time or energy for exercise, no time for sleep or rest, no time for family or friends. His attitude turns negative and learning halts. A reinforcing loop emerges that sends the leader into a downward spiral like an airplane has lost power and is out of the pilot's control with little hope of recovery unless the leader can break the cycle and begin to climb again. And this is your, something that you call ARSENAL, which another acronym, the seven best practices, awareness, rest, support, exercise, nutrition, attitude, and learning. And you know, you, you, you go through each one of these and talk about how, you know, some steps to take for awareness, dedicate time to stepping outside yourself, observing your actions for rest. You know, you give great little sections of what to do to rest, force yourself to take breaks, um, include personal time each day. Like you, you go through support. What does support mean? Support is psychological, emotional, and physical people that help you in those categories. So significant other, family, friends, colleagues, coaches, mentors, et cetera. And, and what can you do? Identify these people. And you get, again, you do that for each one of these for exercise. You talk about what, you know, how do you start an exercise program? And I think you use a couple you, you give you give one thing is 60 days, go 60 days, do not miss an exercise session during the first 60 days, not even one. While some say new habits are created in 21 days, I find that for most people, 60 days tends to firmly transform any new behavior into a habit. So, 
And and you obviously are a little bit of an exercise fanatic because you are you still run an Ironman. Yes. <laughs> How'd you get into that? Well, you know, I've always been physical, and about ten years or so ago, I had um, my other son-in-law go do a triathlon, mm-hmm. and then he got with Eric and I, and he said. Hey, we got to do this. Mm-hmm. This is a lot of fun. So wait, how old are you right now? 72. So at 62, you decided it was a good time to start triathlons. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So, so then, you know, got into that. Uh, and then, you know, triathlons are okay. But I thought, you know, Ironman, uh, the distances are considerably, you know, farther. So uh, I got into that. And, you know, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's... Uh, it's a tough day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and especially at 62. So when's the last time you did one? A year ago? Mm, less than a year. I mean, this year. Okay. I, I won this year, and, you know, May I start back again. Hey, are you, are you like, ranked in the world? Um, I was until, I think, last year. Um, you have to do a certain number Got a it. year, uh, and then then you can total up points, and they rank you. So, you know, I think the last, my last ranking was uh, fifth in the U.S., 15th uh, in the world in my age group. So, <laughs> so you definitely recommend exercise, yeah. apparently. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you talk about nutrition, um, you know, eating the right stuff. This is all stuff that we know, but we, we don't want to do. You talk about attitude. Engage in activities that build your self-confidence and self-esteem. Jiu-jitsu. Smile. See the glass as being half full. Um, talk directly to the person you are unhappy with, not to your coworkers about that person. Become a team player. Ask fellow team members what you can do to help them. That's a good attitude adjustment. And then the last one you got is lifelong learning. And again, I'm, I'm breezing through these things right now, and that's why people need to buy the book so that they can get the, the menus themselves and read through. Um, Lifelong learning, this is just such an important thing. Set daily, monthly, quarterly, and annually, annual learning goals. For example, read two books monthly or improve a foreign language skill over the course of a year. Spend time with others who like to learn. Spend time with someone you consider intelligent. Get out of your comfort zone. Learn something you have always wanted to learn but keep putting off. Exercise all parts of your brain by choosing a variety of learning goals. So those are... That's your that's your arsenal approach to controlling stress. Awareness, rest, support, exercise, nutrition, attitude, and learning. Here's the takeaway on arsenal. These are these are cool. An unaware brain is a surprised brain. A tired brain is a grumpy brain. An unsupported brain is a sad brain. An unfit brain is a slow brain. A hungry brain is a distracted brain. A negative brain is an angry brain. And an unused brain is a forgetful brain. Anything I'm missing on Arsenal? No, that's good. I mean, we, we have a, an actual assessment that you can take online. Shows you where you are. Um, so, I mean, we, we use it quite a bit with our clients. Um, stress is always an issue out there. So mm-hmm. if we can help them find a way to, to bring the stress down, they'll perform better, particularly as a leader. I'm, I'm going to wrap up with this book here. Training leaders is similar to training parachutists. You have to train them to jump before pushing them out the door. And then you say this closing out this book in in preparing for the future we should keep in mind the old native american analogy that describes the past present and future as a log burning in a fire the part of the log that has burned into ash is yesterday the part that is burning is today and the part that will burn soon is tomorrow we are the fire we can only live today and what we do today determines whether our fire will still be burning tomorrow Well, <laughs> that's, uh, that, that wraps up this book. And again, I mean, I breezed through this thing. There were some points that I definitely wanted to, to talk about and, and let people know about. The book is called The Stress Effect by Henry L. Thompson. And it's available on Amazon. Um, 
what else you know we've covered a ton you know we've we we've merged a bunch of podcasts here um what else do we need to know about what you've got going on what about high performance systems hpsys.com that's your company that's and, and this is what you do yeah that's uh what we do we work with leaders around the world uh, we do a lot of work uh, helping them uh, improve their performance we look at their co- cognitive ability we can measure that then we can work with you to make sure you're, you're getting uh, the most out of it um, we work with manufacturing and building those high performance work teams so a while ago when you were talking about giving people control if you take a, a high performance work team in, in a manufacturing plant and you say okay you guys can start making decisions so uh, you can even decide that Echo Charles gets tomorrow off mm-hmm. because he's got something he has to do, and Eric's going to come in and work his shift so he can go do it. And you don't have to come to me, the supervisor, to ask permission to do that. You guys are already authorized to do all kinds of things like that. If it's going to make the team perform better, you guys do it. So you run yourself. You take care of yourself. And I'm, I'm available if you need to ask me questions or maybe there's some resources you don't have, then it, let me know. I'll go find your resources for you. So we, we do a lot of work like that. We do a lot with stress management. We do a lot with decision making under stress. So nuclear operators that are making decisions about whether or not the plant's going to melt down because uh, sometimes the stress gets really high in the control room when they have an incident. Um, so teaching them how to get control of the stress and not lock up. Uh, law enforcement, you know, for the most part, I mean, it, it, law enforcement has a different approach um, to dealing with bad guys than the military does. I mean, a, a law enforcement SWAT team, it's a different approach when they go into a room. When they kick a door down and go in, it's not like having a special ops team, SEAL team, come through that door. Mm-hmm. You know, when you go through, you're going to take out everything in there. You know, and the, when the, the police SWAT team goes through, there's a bad guy in there they want, mm-hmm. and they're not going to take out everybody that's in the room necessarily. So they, it's a very different approach going in, but it's very stressful, and there's things that they can do and things they need to understand about what they can do when the stress level goes up, what it's gonna do to their decisions. Um, So we work with them on that, we can train them. Firefighters, same thing, EMTs. So we do a lot of work like that. We also work, you know, with uh, vets, vet organizations. So we have this um, thing going on, you know, 22 push-ups, because we have 22 vets a day uh, committing suicide. Um, so the 22 push-ups is an awareness thing so we get that all over social media uh, people doing push-ups so, uh, you know you had said something earlier about you know Echo Charles is probably going to knock out 22 for us <laughs> to a video so we can post him out there tomorrow so, uh, and you know we had uh, the challenge coins and we, I have a group of people around the country that, that have some of our coins and if they run into a vet that they think you know maybe on the edge and they give him a corn it says welcome home thank you for your service all that kind of stuff uh, and they reach out to him sometimes all you have to do is smile at somebody there's a there's a person out there today that is on a mission to end their life before the day is over and very often they set up a condition i'm going to ride the bus to this place where i'm going to terminate myself if nobody speaks to me if nobody smiles at me, nobody recognizes my presence between now and the time I get to this place, I'm going to take my life. But if I get some kind of interaction from somebody, I won't do it. And they, <coughs> they get on the bus, they go, nobody acknowledges them, you know, and, and they commit suicide. Just reaching out, just talking to someone sometimes can turn them around, and all of a sudden they don't do it. You can take them off of that list of 22. Um, so we do that. Um, is, there a, is there a website to go for that? Is that like a, there is is a, that a nonprofit? Or? Uh, yeah, there's a Mission 22 okay. uh, yep. website. Yep. Uh, on our website, uh, we put on our Stress Effect website, we uh, 
quit things you can do to recognize vets, um, not just vets, but firefighters, police, you know, uh, so was, there are other groups that are doing it, but um, particularly the vets, particularly, uh, and it's not just the older vets, but sometimes it's easier to see in them. But if you watch, you can see people that are not acting quite right, and they may have on their their hat. Uh, you, know, you can see they've been in Afghanistan or wherever they are, and you need to talk to them. And you you had one a person uh, on one of your uh, podcasts very recently who uh, is a suicide su- survivor. Uh, the person attempted the suicide and and somebody you know snatched mm-hmm. her up and got her out and, and she's doing all kinds of things mm-hmm. that she wouldn't have done yeah if, no doubt about it uh, so um everybody has a purpose there's a reason that you survived as long as you have and to go out and terminate yourself i mean it, all of a sudden it, all those things don't happen mm-hmm. i mean you you might be the person that saves a lot of other lives if you stick around and I don't think we as a nation do very well uh, taking care of the vets, uh, doing the transitions. And I know a lot of the uh, vets who do take their own lives are, you know, they, they're not in the VA program. They're just trying to do things on their own. And, you know, they get in that downward spiral. But if we see one, we talk to them. And it's amazing some of the stories I'm getting back from uh some of the people that's kind of joined me in the in this program, women uh, who are out walking or running, and they'll see a guy with his veteran hat on or something that clues them in, and they just talk to him. And the guys just they turn around. I mean, all of them don't, but you know, as military people, I think you know we have an obligation, we have an accountability, you know, to take care of our people. So anyway, we we do thing a lot of things like that. Well, that's uh, I mean that's awesome that you already you served your country, you know, in so many other ways and continue to serve the the vets and I don't know. Do you have any other final thoughts? Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come you know talk about uh, some of the things that went on in SOG and some of the leadership and other topics that we got on today I, I appreciate you giving me that opportunity you guys have been great great questions uh, it's been a fun day so i have a question oh what's a snake eater you said I, that a few times snake spe- eater. Oh, he's a snake eater special forces just like a term yeah. it's like a it's like a term yeah. for like a special forces guy oh. they'll, they'll say it about it, seals they'll say it like oh that guy's a snake eater you, you're kind of saying it in, in in the context like it was bad almost like w- from who was saying it in your stories the competition oh yes okay, yeah, so okay. I'm, a, I'm a ranger and you're mm. special forces yeah yeah gotcha know? so I, I'm I'm better than you obviously. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. gotcha so when I call you a snake eater it's bad yeah yeah you know when gotcha. I call myself one, it's good. Yeah, yeah. So. Cool. Right on. <laughs> right on. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, you know, thanks to Eric for for uh, getting you out here, and I'm telling you, this is just a total honor for me to be able to sit here and and hear your stories and pick your brain. And so, thank you for coming on and 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 sharing everything with us. And you know, more important, and I think it's pretty obvious. Thank you for your service and thank you when I when I hear your stories and I think about the times that you thought you would not come back and you went anyway and you did that for me and for my kids and for our country and I just wanted to say thank you and it's been an honor to talk to you and I can't wait to hear feedback from people and I'm sure they'll have so many questions that I'll have to drag you out here again at some point. Yeah, I well, appreciate your service and thank you for that and uh, all the things that you've done and you're doing for the vets. I mean, people listen to these podcasts. They listen to what you guys say, and it makes a difference. And you're, you know, it, it, you just you don't realize when you help most of the people that you help.
because you don't know where they were when they listen to your podcast or, or listen to you talk, uh, but you're impacting people all over. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad I could come in and, and, you know, just hang out with you guys and uh, watch how you do this because you're really making an impact. Well, well, I appreciate it. The door is always open to this <clears throat> podcast room. The microphone will be waiting for you anytime you want to come back. <laughs> and I'm sure that the amount of people will hear what you've had to say and see what you've been through and, and, and you're going to help infinitely more people. And it's so appreciated, again, not just for what you've done in the past, but for what you're still doing now. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Echo. So once again, Dick Thompson has left the building. And once again, I cannot even get my mind around what he's done and what he's learned and what he is passing on in these lessons. Because really, there's no better way to learn and there's no better teacher than learning from those who have gone before us, who have tested the limits of human capacity for performance and leadership and decision making. And here we are, we get to sit here We have to actually sit here and absorb the knowledge of these great men who pay dearly for this knowledge and, as we know, many of their comrades paid with their very lives. So let us never forget that. That for every lesson, there was blood spilled. For every story, there is a man who did not return. So value these lessons, lessons that we can apply to our lives, to our family, to our businesses, to our communities. Everything we do, we can apply what we're learning here. Don't squander these lessons. Pay attention to them. Be aware. We talk a lot about awareness. Be aware of your own shortfalls. And then apply these lessons. That's what you have to do. You have to actually apply them. You can't sit back and listen to them. You gotta actually apply them. So, Echo. We are all looking to learn. We are all looking to somehow make up for our own shortfalls and apply things to our lives that will make us better. Do you know of anything? Softball coming at you. Do you know of anything (laughs) that, broadly speaking, can make our lives better? Yes, broadly and narrowly. Okay, that would be? Jiu-jitsu. Okay. By far. Yeah, okay. Now, is it possible that you're just a person that's just into it and so you're you're biased because you like jujitsu and now you think everyone could get, gain from it and benefit from it, even though you, that could be wrong? Yes. Is that a possibility? Yes. That's a possibility. Well. Actually, I was going to say that's actually not possible. Yeah. Well, I, I'm more saying yes to the bias part of it. Okay. You are biased, but even if you're biased, then that doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong. Correct. I would tell you this, you're biased, you're biased in favor of jiu-jitsu, yes. okay. and that doesn't affect the outcome of someone starting jiu-jitsu right. and really gaining a ton from it in making their life better. Yes, Correct. Across it's, the board. It's kind of like, you know how, um, hmm, like the sun, if I say, hey, the sun is warm on my face today, mm-hmm. and I really like that. Okay. And I'm biased towards the sun. Okay. What if someone doesn't like that? It's still warm on their face. See what I'm saying? Okay. Let's say not that only that they didn't. No, no, Brad, that was a perfect no. analogy. Yeah, actually, yeah, it's pretty bad. But <laughs> nonetheless, short notice, that's sort of, sort of how it goes. Hey, we'll and take what we can get. <laughs> factually, factually, jujitsu will improve your life. Yes. Factually. Unless you do it wrong. Here's the thing. Unless you do it wrong. Yeah, yeah. I guess that is possible. Yes. And I don't mean do jujitsu wrong. I mean approach yeah. jujitsu wrong. So like, okay, so you mentioned before how how the person, like a person in the beginning 
you your confidence go like can go backwards mm-hmm. one step because you're like uh oh like how many people know this yeah. and I didn't even realize it so you're kind of apprehensive just in general that is yes if you approach it correctly in my opinion because if you approach it wrong you're kind of like oh I I know a a choke now I know arm lock now I'm better than everybody mm-hmm. you know kind of thing that's the reality of jiu-jitsu that you won't feel that way because you'll get before you choke you learn a choke but then you get choked and arm locked and commuted 15 times yeah. in one day mm-hmm. so you don't feel more confident out of the gate I didn't know yeah yeah but then again no you know what a small part of me did did oh. only if well, i knew the other yes <laughs> it, it totally was but on top of it i would know you know i know who in my little what do you say in my circles like yeah. i knew who didn't train and who did just like we all do you yeah. know i mean strangers i'd all be i'd always be like man like you, you know what that guy you gotta knows? watch out yeah just like you know how like sometimes you're like you don't know if that guy has a weapon or something like that yeah. that feeling it's that feeling yeah. you know but a little bit worse because if a guy has a weapon, you can kind of run away. If someone has you in, a, in any kind of jujitsu scenario, like mounted or in an arm bar. Isn't it whatever. weird you can be mounted and you can't get away? Literally can't get away. Yeah. You can scratch, bite, go for groin uh, stuff. Like, oh, bro, that, you oh, cannot well, get away. Matter. You will not get away. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's bad. And I, and I would think about that stuff too, man. Yeah. It's scary. But It's just like the whole concept of passing the guard, right? Yeah. It doesn't seem... Like it, if you said, okay, the idea of jujitsu, one part of jujitsu is you have to get around the other person's legs. Yeah. That's the whole, that's what you got to do. You'd think, oh, well, yeah. how long is that going to take? Four <laughs> seconds, three seconds, maybe yeah. even two seconds, whatever. I'll get around their legs. Mm-hmm. And then you realize it can take years and years and years <laughs> of trying to get past one person's guard. If not never, sometimes. Yeah. And that's Bro, a crazy thing. Very crazy. Remember, it was I, I think it was you at the muster where I was like, we were talking about that. I forget if you were saying it or I was saying it. Mm-hmm. I think you were saying it, and I was like, maybe add it. I don't know. Nonetheless, I was like, because technically getting past someone's guard is just getting past their legs, just like yep. how you said. And you can use this whole room. I don't care if you walk out the door and sneak back in the back yep. door. You still can't do yep. it. Yep. And like you can, like I was, and I did a little demonstration where I'd be like, okay, this is like, all I got to do is get past your legs. Guard, mm. no guard. I just got to get past your legs. Right. So I backed way up and I started like walking around. All you do is like turn yeah. and it just, re- it's, yeah, it's crazy how just how impossible that can kind of seem, you know, but that's the jujitsu, you know? Yep. And that's one tiny little sliver of an aspect of it. Yep. It's just passing the guard. Yep. Gets, it gets, it goes deep. No, um, nonetheless, but yes, if you pr- approach it correctly, I have no doubt in my mind. I don't know under any circumstance where it wouldn't be an improvement in your life. Net, net. Check. I cannot think of one. So, so overall, we're saying do jujitsu. Yes, sir. And once we decide to do jujitsu, which we just decided, yes. now we need to get a gi. Yes. We get an origin gi from originmain.com. You get a lot of stuff from there. But yes, you get your gi from there. Many different options. Speaking of gis. I've been noticing people getting blue belt, winning tournaments, saying, hey, I joined jiu-jitsu because of Jocko. Yeah. Because of this. Well, yeah. So there's there's, uh, at camp this year, there was people that were like, I'm a Jocko blue belt. Right. And I was like, what is that? And they say, I started training because of the podcast. I was like, oh, awesome. And I've met, I think, two Jocko purple belts now. The podcast has only been out four, four years? Four-ish, yeah. Yeah, we're coming up on four years. So that means someone out of the gate was like, okay, I'm getting, because you got to, you know, it takes about four years to get a purple belt if you're like training hard, right? right? This is no slack. Someone that just jumps in. So I think I've I've met two like Jocko purple belts. (laughs) So legit. But yeah, that's that's super cool. Yes. So, so, So you're not alone. Don't feel like, you ever feel like, oh, well, I don't, I, no one's really actually doing that. So oh. I'm not doing it. Yeah, no, people yeah. are absolutely people doing, are it. doing it. Yes, 100%. My, my, my wife just uh, was in England. She delivered a friend. She delivered an origin gi to England for her friend's husband, Anthony. Mm-hmm. He's obs- He's, you know, he's like whatever, 50 years. He's like my age, 40. Eight fifty-two, mm-hmm. something like that. Obsessed with the jujitsu. Yeah, he's been training for six months. Oh, Jocko yeah. white belt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's like in the game, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. At some point, you commit. You say, you know what? I'm going to do this. Yeah. 
Just do it. Yeah. Just do it. This is how you know you, and we haven't used the expression used to bug recently, but this is how you kind of know when you're sort of trying to figure out moves when you're like in bed yeah. or driving or yeah. this kind of stuff, what is like constantly rolling in your mind. Yeah. It might be this a good feeling. Yeah. Because it does translate. When you go back in, it, like you work it yeah. out, it's good, man. It's but good. yes, people are in the game. So... Yeah, and you're gonna train gi, so get a jujitsu gi from originmain.com. Get a rash guard so you can train no gi, which is also important. Very important. As Echo would say. Yes. I would just say important, <laughs> but he would say important. I don't I don't hear the difference. Yeah, feel well, the difference that's because at all. you don't hear anything. <laughs> and, and then the, then the problem is, <laughs> the problem is you're gonna wanna represent off the mats. Off the mats, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And we can go into the whole thing about how you can't wear a gi to the club. Most right? of the time, yes. You yeah. can't wear a gi to the grocery store. Most generally time, speaking. Yes, generally now speaking. you can get away with gi pants, let's face it. Yes, let's sure face it. Can. Let's face it. I yeah. think most of us have been into a grocery store <laughs> in gi pants. Yes, I know I have. Especially the black ones. The yeah, origin like, black ones, they look kind of dumb. Well, you, you know? could probably go to a club in the origin black you gi pants. You could pull it off. You could pull it off. What yes. kind of level, what kind of fashion? You know you're a fashion guy, but not what, prob, not what, a where does guy. that where does that fit into the fashion world? Like what would you wear with black gi pants to a club? To no, to a let's say a bar. You're going to a bar, you put on the gi pants, and you just, what are you just wearing a t-shirt? Or just an origin t-shirt? Well, Just I, a I, def core t-shirt. Let's clarify. First off, I'm not a fashion person. But if I was, <laughs> I would say there is no fashionable, unless you're going extreme new age fashion, which I can dig, then yeah, you could wear it. You know, you know what's shirt. funny? You ever heard of this uh, store called Patagonia? It's... They make bell, yes. outerwear and stuff. Oh, they, yeah, they yeah, yeah. Outdoor okay. clothing, right? Yeah. Well, Patagonia used to have pants, they, maybe they still do, that were called gi pants. Okay. That's what they were called. They probably still have them. Right on. So maybe, you know, they're over there wearing their gi pants out. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Maybe we just need Wait, to get in the game and but, represent even harder. But are they called gi pants? Gi, yes, they're called gi pants. Or are they called gi pants? They're called gi pants. They're They're... When you, I remember back in the day, I would read the little description yeah. and it <laughs> sure. would say, yeah. you know, the gi pants is based on the loose fitting martial arts okay. pants. Yeah, yeah we'd say that pants. in a little description. Yes, okay. So, yeah. All right. Well, yeah, I mean, man, it's kind of like whatever you did. I mean, it wouldn't be a violation overall, mm. especially if there were the black ones. The blue or the white, mm, maybe. The kind where people will look, like if you wear Oh, a, yeah, yeah. You know, you couldn't wear white no. gi pants out mm-hmm. for just no reason. But the black, you could kind of get away with. It'd be hard to pull off, yes, sir. Yeah. So, anyways. But. If you don't want to wear your <laughs> gi pants and you still want to represent, that's fine. You can get a pair of. Origin jeans, which are also made in America. The little brass rivets are made in America. The zipper is made in America. The thread is made in America. And they're sewn by craftsmen, craftswomen mm-hmm. up in Maine. That's what the, that's where they're made. So everything is there, there's a they're as American as American can be. That's what those jeans are. They when you put them on, you are embracing America yes, to sir. its core and you're rebuilding America because you got to remember all those none of those people had jobs none of those people at origin had jobs five years ago three years ago two years ago because all the jobs have been taken overseas we're bringing them back so embrace America and embrace Origin jeans, American two kinds. Denim. There's there's the heavy. There's the there's the factory jeans is what we call them. That's those the, are the, the OG, the, the original, the original ones. Mm-hmm. And then there's the Delta sixty eight, which are mine, yep. my signature jeans. Yep. Little but they don't more. say Jocko on them because that's not. No, they say Delta sixty eight, named after my forefathers in the SEAL teams in Vietnam that wore jeans into the Mekong Delta to hunt down the enemy. And they did it because they were more durable. They lasted longer. They were quiet. So that's what we did. We brought them back. Mm-hmm. Delta 68. Represent. Yep. Good ones. Get some. What else? Well, from Origin, well, supplements, of course, keeping us in the game. So, you know, 50 years old, your friends, 
your wife's friend's husband. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what was the name again? Anthony. Anthony. 50, we'll just say 50, around 50. Mm-hmm. So, because people mm-hmm. will ask, mm-hmm. like, am I too old to start jujitsu? No, I'm you're, 40. You're not. Yeah, negative. I know a guy 41 and started and is kind of a, a little bit of a handful oh, to dang. deal with. 41, mm-hmm. which, you know, that's not terribly old. But it's not terribly well. Either. No, actually, what surprised me is just a handful to deal with. That means because yes. there are some people that whether they're twenty or whether they're forty, they they just have a little something. Yeah, they have a little. They have some skill, some inherent good instincts. Yep, they yep. have some inherent strength. Yes, sir. Yeah, man. Flexibility. All they got that. something. Yes. I, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> the point is for everybody and you can even train hard but if you do you do have to mind these things like okay i'm not 20 years old anymore mm. i'm 50 years old now so you gotta you do have to mind those things yeah. not nothing yep so if you're going death matches eight rounds six minutes mm-hmm. okay that's gonna mm-hmm. not, that's not nothing there either so but here good news joint warfare krill oil these things will keep you deep in the game. Mm-hmm. Take from me. I can turn up the workout. Personally, I'm speaking for myself. I'm no anomaly. I can go deep, hardcore on a workout, week after week after week. Difference is if I do take joint work for curl oil, and if I don't take joint work for curl oil, I won't be able to go mm-hmm. if I don't. If I do, I can't. This applies to everybody, like I said. So yeah. that question is, sir, answered. Yes, and if you if you want to make it a little easier to maintain, then just get the subscription. We yes. have the subscription now, so that way you can just here comes Joint Warfare once a month. You get your bottle. There you go. You start to get your krill oil. You get it, and you and you actually save money. So check out the subscriptions there on OriginMain.com, and don't forget about Mulk, which is additional protein, which you also need if you're. If you're lifting, if you're training, if you're running, if you're alive. Yeah. And on top of that, if you get done with a really good dinner, even if you had something delicious like steak, and then you got done and you still have this little this little thing in the back of your head that you just need a little little bit of sweetness, a little bit of that hitter. <laughs> you can just mix it with one scoop hitter. Yeah. Just mix yourself a one scoop milk hitter. You- and you'll go to bed completely satisfied yes. you will feel like you know, look i i'm i'm completely satisfied with what i've eaten yes and and you're stronger and healthier on your way to recovery yes too um you will not relate to this but people might be able to okay so when you get on the path f- from not being on the path mm-hmm. your initial get on mm-hmm. might include quitting drinking Cutting down drinking, but probably quitting drinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's a common thing that I heard and experienced with quitting drinking where you kind of crave like sweets or like desserts. Interesting. Something that'll like give you a, like a, what a dopamine or whatever the chemical (laughs) hit. Yeah. 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 So you'll want that. Like you'll want like cookies or stuff, you know, because you're not drinking anymore or whatever. That'll be like a result. Yep. This is what I heard and literally experienced. And it, it was like stronger than I expected to. Now, if you have the milk, boom, problem solved, hundred percent, because it does supply that you know the dessert kind of scenario. Mm-hmm. Especially if you put some peanut butter in there, <laughs> bro. Put some peanut butter in there, no factor, bro. You're on the path, hundred percent. No, no side effects, no drawbacks. Yeah. Speaking of no side effects, no drawbacks. If you get the RTD, the ready to drink. Discipline go in a can. RTD. RTD. Did you just make that up? No, no, that's a thing. That's a product name. It's like, oh, this is an RTD. Sounds like you made it up. I didn't make it up. It's it just sounds RTD. like you made it up. Okay, it's a, it says it right there on the page. Oh, yeah, high speed, low drag, RTD. Yeah. Do it. Make it happen. RTD. <laughs> no, but speaking of that, when... When I was when I went up to uh, Theo Vaughn's podcast mm-hmm. and he was drinking it and he started getting that you know you start feeling it because you can <laughs> feel it yeah. and he was pretty funny and he says he said mm. something along the lines of you know I might find myself back on cocaine after uh, doing this mm. so he 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 started Gateway feeling thing, like yeah. the and I said no you don't need to go back on co- cocaine you know I'm thinking to myself you don't need cocaine yeah. you just need a little bit more discipline go. RTD, yeah, yeah, man. Which is not an adi- it won't make you. It's not a gateway it, drug. It won't. It's not a gateway drug. It's not going to make you end up sleeping on a park bench. Somewhere. No, no. 
the opposite. Actually, yes. you might lift and up you, the park. Yeah, bench. you might buy the park. <laughs> That's what's probably going to happen. Yep. So, so there true. You go. Also, Jocko White Tea. Mm-hmm. Speaking of picking up park <laughs> benches and whatnot, yeah, Jocko White go. Tea. Boom, and it happens to taste good, and it happens to be certified organic. You like mentioning that? I, yeah, man, I do. It was a big deal to get that little, st- little qualification. I dig it. It's good. It's very good, actually, because here's the thing. Like, yeah, you. Well, even when you first do you think people do you think people in Nebraska care if it's certified organic, or do you think it's only forty mile radius around <laughs> LA? <laughs> I think some people in Nebraska care. That's what I think. Right on. And this is why. We're because, with you. Because when you first announced that you're drinking pomegranate white tea. Oh yeah, people were asking, is it organic? Is that what you're gonna say? Th- that's part of it, okay. yes. I'm saying that whole experience for, well, primarily, it was like, all right, that's surprising. That doesn't sound very hardcore. You would think maybe you're drinking something else. Mm-hmm. But when you're like, pomegranate white tea. Okay, now we can do that. Or we can admit we drink these white teas, which is good, but a lot of our wives drink white tea and they tend to care about certified organic in my experience, which is very <laughs> limited by the way. <laughs> so okay. I'm saying pomegranate white tea, Jocko white tea is for everybody. And just cause you're not all, I don't care about certified organic just cause you're like that doesn't mean everyone else. In fact, I would think the majority of the people would rather it be certified organic than non-organic. I would agree with that. And I would say that the root of me drinking pomegranate white tea is when I used to debrief SEAL platoons out in the desert mm-hmm. after they would get done with their brief. And I would drink chocolate white tea during it. But by the time I'd get done, I have all these notes and just get into it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so check that out as well. It's good. Also, Jocko's store. It's called Jocko's store. So you go to jockostore.com. We do have t shirts, hoodies. Rash guards, hats, three kinds of hats, by the way, three types of headgear, mm-hmm. by the way, women stuff, you know, decals and stickers. These are all things if you want to represent while you're on the path. Discipline equals freedom, deaf core to the core. I like it. Good. All these things. And that's one that's going to permeate kind of everything, the good. You know, when you find the good in this mm-hmm. situation. All these things you can represent. Get your stuff. JockoStore.com. If you like something, get something on that one. Also, I got to mention that I have a little, I have some events I'm going to be doing mm-hmm. around the country. Starting in January, around the time the book comes out a little bit earlier. I'm going to be in Washington, D.C., Austin, Texas. I'm going to be somewhere in the vicinity of New York. I'm going to be somewhere in the vicinity of L.A., Somewhere in the vicinity of Seattle, Washington, and somewhere in the vicinity of San Francisco. So I will let you know, but just pay attention. I just got an email right before we started recording this that that is actually factually happening. I don't even know what I'm going to call it yet. So I will be live on stage interacting. So there you go. Boom. Also, speaking of live. But I imagine when I do those live events that there will be lots of people representing representing big time they will be representing in their garments oh yes that they're on the path yes we normally see a lot of people that are wearing something that says deaf core or in the wild yeah so there you go big time also subscribe to this podcast if you haven't already on your itunes if you listen to itunes mm-hmm. google play if that's what you listen to stitcher if you have android what's with the voice bro <laughs> No, I'm just okay. I'm just delegating the listening <laughs> avenues. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and leave a review if you're in the mood. If you're in the mood, leave a review. Yeah. Leave, reviews are welcome. You know what I'm saying? I haven't read reviews lately on the podcast, but I've done that before. I'll do it again. Yeah. If I see some good ones, some some ones that kind of nail it. Yeah. Kind of have layers. We're looking for layers. Yes. I think primarily. Yes. That's the thing. So, and you notice they said welcome. Reviews are welcome. Because the difference between welcome and accepted. So we already know reviews are accepted. We already know you can write a review. Are they expected? They're not expected. Either. I wouldn't say They're expected. Just no. Yeah, welcome. Meaning, like, if there's a review that's like, we kind of like that. Like, we kind of, you know, like we kind of, you know, puts a smile on on certain people's faces. And we're gonna go ahead and read that one. Don't forget that we have another podcast called Grounded. It's just a podcast called Grounded where we talk about other things. 
And I think that's the way you, you said this on the last little support section, because mm-hmm. how do you describe what we talk about on Grounded? And I think the answer is we talk about other things. Yes, other things. You know, yes. what does that mean? Well, it's other things. Other things, I think yeah. that pretty. I think that spells it out. Yeah, man, uh, yeah, as opposed to what? These things? It's not these things, it's, it's more other things. It's just, yeah, it's other things, yeah, for sure. Equally important things. Maybe not quite. Well, varying levels <laughs> of importance. <laughs> we'll say okay. that. Maybe not equally important, but well, interesting. Yes, I think and, so. And here's the here's something that is important. I will say this. Even though they might not be of equal importance, they are things that will grant you a better understanding, a broader understanding of things. Yes. Of other things. The more you understand other things, the more you'll understand these things. That is true. Yeah. Very well put. Thank you. Do you, you need to change whatever that little, you know how that, you know how a podcast has a little, no blurb about what it's about. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you've changed the Jocko podcast one since you wrote it when you were nine years old. (laughs) (laughs) But you should make the grounded one say a podcast about other things. Yeah. All right, I'm going to do it. That's actually a good cool. idea. I do too. So, uh, for example, Jason Gardner talking about how he lives up in the mountains and when they go jogging, they got to carry guns just in case they get attacked <laughs> by freaking mountain lions. <laughs> those are other things we talk about. Those are, those, those, yeah, One of the many. Thing, but it's Some, important to understand that. Yes. We also have a Warrior Kid podcast. This is a great podcast, not just for kids, but if you're a parent, you can use it to help you parent, but you can also learn from it. I am a parent. I got four kids, two of which are over the age of 18, 20, 18, got a 16-year-old, and got a 10-year-old. I'm passing on some lessons learned, covertly Mm -hmm. flanking you with some lessons learned that will help you. And I wish I would have had this podcast when my kids were younger, but Warrior Kid Podcast, let your kids check it out. And don't forget to get yourself some Warrior Kid soap from irishoaksranch.com where young Aiden has got his own business. And it's not just a business that's making money. It's a business that's helping people stay clean. <laughs> that was good. There. Speaking of staying clean, go on YouTube. <laughs> that, <laughs> was, that was There's a rough transition. Then there's hey, just man. bad ones. Hey, hey, you just called for bad. No, 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 no. It, it does. Anyway, so yeah. So yeah, if you want to watch the podcast, watch and listen. Put on your smart TV in your office, gym. It's a place of... You know, place of workout. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I know what you're doing. Or if you just want to watch it on yes. computer anyway, it's a video version. So, yeah, man, yeah. you know, because some people, because video, watching video, smart TVs, the per, the permeation, permeation. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. So. Prevalence of smart TVs <laughs> is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have more YouTube is what I'm saying. You're okay. going to have more, you know, yeah. see what I'm saying? Yeah. So boom, subscribe, put it up, put it on there. Listen to it. Do it. See what I'm saying? Do it. And if you need some mm, some psychological help getting through a moment of weakness, you don't have to be alone. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to fight that fight by yourself. You can get fire support when you press play on your phone of an album called Psychological Warfare. The artist known as me, Jocko, <laughs> laying down tracks. No music, just voice, just me talking mm-hmm. and telling you, hey, this is what you can do to overcome that particular moment of weakness. Whether it's you're thinking you don't want to go to the gym, whether it's you think you're going to eat a donut. You're going to eat a donut? No, press play on your phone and take a listen. Take a listen. We'll get you right. We'll keep you on the path. And if you need a, a visual, Reminder to be on the path, to stay on the path. Check out flipsidecanvas.com with Dakota Meyer. It's Dakota Meyer's company. And he's creating graphic visual designs that will help remind you where you are, where you're going, and where you want to be. Flipsidecanvas.com. Also, I have some books. The first book is The Stress Effect, written by Colonel. Henry Dick Thompson. So we just reviewed that. It's an outstanding book. There's all kinds of information in there. I only read a small percentage of it, but tons of knowledge. So order that. You can find it on jockopodcast.com under books from the podcast. And then there is 
Leadership Strategy and Tactics, which is my newest book coming out January 14th. I just open up the index. Open up the index and what do I see? Here's some sections. Some sections you can read about. Fear-inducing moments, failure, feedback, fighting, fire teams, flanking maneuver, foot patrol, friendly fire, leading from the front, front lines, FTX, full mission profiles, good teams, gossip, guidance, Hackworth, David, hands-off leadership, headcounts, heavy-handed approach, high ground, high-risk operations, honesty, hope, humility. These are some of the topics that co- get covered in the Leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual. I wrote this so you, it's, so you can refer to it. You can open it up and say, hey, I got a person that, I'm, that is, has a negative attitude. What should I do with them? Oh, I'll open up the, the, the field manual and, and follow the directions. So that's what that book is. Tons of good information in there for you. Don't forget, if you've got kids or you know kids, help those kids out by getting them the knowledge that they need to live a better life. Where are you going to get that? Warrior Kid 1, 2, and 3. Warrior Kid 1, Way of the Warrior Kid. Warrior Kid 2, Mark's Mission. And Warrior Kid 3, Where There's a Will. These books are the books that every human wishes they had when they were 8 years old, 9 years old, 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old. Make that wish come true for someone that you know, for a kid that you know, your kids, some other kids, nephews, nieces, bring it to the library, whatever you can do to spread the word. And then there's Mikey and the Dragons, which is a book that teaches even littler kids, maybe four, five, six, seven, eight, how to overcome fear, which is what you have to do when you're growing up as a human being. You gotta learn to overcome fear. That book actually teaches little kids how to do it. Mikey and the Dragons. Get that for every kid you know. Get that for the library. Get that for the for the classroom. Spread the word. And then there's the Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. You don't know what to get that person for Christmas. Cool. Do you want that person to be weak? Do you want that person to be out of shape? Do you want that person to have mental trauma? Or do you want them to be on the path? Give them the gift of discipline. <laughs> Give them the gift of discipline. Discipline equals freedom field manual. There's no book like it. It's it's a different, it hits you in a different way. It's not, it's not normal. And that's why it's effective. Discipline equals freedom field manual. Get that. Also, the audio version of that is not on Audible. It's on MP3s through iTunes or Amazon Music or Google Play. Also, we have Extreme Ownership and the Dichotomy of Leadership where Leif Babin and I wrote to explain what we learned from a leadership perspective on the battlefield and how you can use those same tools in whatever doing, in leading whatever situation you are leading in. And also we have Echelon Front, the leadership consultancy where we solve problems through leadership. That's what we do. We come into businesses and we help with the problems that the businesses have. We help them solve those problems 100% based on fixing leadership, improving leadership, aligning leadership. When you align and you fix and you improve leadership, that turns businesses, companies, and teams around. So go to echelonfront.com if you want some of that. EF Online, you don't necessarily have to bring us in to speak to every person in your company. You can go to efonline.com and we can train your people or you virtually. That's what it is. It's a virtual training. It's interactive. You actually get put in leadership scenarios inside that training online and you gotta make decisions. It's like choose your own adventure. So that's efonline.com. We have the muster dates coming out shortly for our leadership conference, extremeownership.com for that where we come with the entire Echelon Front team live and in person and we bring the knowledge that we have and share it with you And then we have EF Overwatch and EF Legion where we are taking selected military personnel. We are ensuring that they understand the principles that we talk about, the principles of extreme ownership, the principles of the dichotomy of leadership. We make sure that they know and understand those and then we place them into companies in the civilian sector so that those leaders 
can lead and help those companies win. Go to EFOverwatch.com or EF Legion for that. And if you if you need more of us, which is really just hard to even imagine that someone could want to hear more of either of us, but if you want to find us, you can. We're on the interwebs. Dick Thompson, Colonel Dick Thompson, Colonel Henry Dick Thompson. He is on Twitter. He is at HPS underscore CEO, and he's at HPSYS.com, which is for high performance systems. If you want to check him out and learn from him, he's just an unbelievable human being. And it's an honor to have sat with him. As far as Echo and I, we are also on the interwebs, we are on Twitter, we are on Instagram. And we are on that Facebook Echo is at Echo Charles. And I am at Jocko Willink. And once again, just complete thanks. Sincerest possible thanks. Gratitude to Dick Thompson for coming on this program. And sharing his lessons with us and of course we thank him for his incredible service and sacrifice to our great nation for what he's done inside the military and for what he's done since he's left the military so thank you colonel salute and appreciate it and obviously an open door anytime you want to come back and to the rest of our servicemen and women out there who stand watch for us every day. Thanks to what, thanks to you for what you do. And the same goes to our police and law enforcement and firefighters and paramedics and EMTs and dispatchers and correctional officers and border patrol and secret service and all the first responders out there. You also make sacrifices to protect us So thank you for what you do. And to everyone else out there, just stay aware. Be aware. Be aware of what leadership is. Be aware of what stress is. Be aware of what cognitive ability and emotional reactions. And be aware of Stress and the impacts that stress has on your decision-making process And think about that and also Think about this Think about the fact that you're free You're free our country is free and we are free because of the heroism and valor of those warriors that faced fear and horror and death and still moved forward and got after it and until next time this is echo and jocko out